I'm very proud to introduce the employees of Commodore and uh, moderated by our showrunner, Jeff Brace. Um, and I will pass it off to Bill Hurd to introduce the rest as, as he affectionately refers to it, the Commodore Gaggle Fest. I, I actually have a different word for it, but we can't use it now. Got okay. it. Um, and so the Commodore Ensemble. Are you starting or am I starting? Um, you introduce I'll, me I'll, and then I'll introduce everybody. All right, sounds good. So all right. um, as you said, I'm Jeff Brace. I'm the showrunner for VCF East. Um, I started um, looking at the themes for the show and one of the themes I wanted to do was the uh, anniversary of the Commodore 64, uh, 40th anniversary, but I wanted to make it a little bit general, so the theme, Computer for the Masses. Um, then I said, you know, Bill, you know, do you know these guys? And I was going to invite some of the creators of the 64, and he's like, you know what? I see where you're going with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Bill Hurd, uh, creator of, one of the creators of the Commodore 128, he's going to introduce everybody here. Um, a lot of different employees, engineers, marketing people for Commodore. Where's Albert? Albert Charpentier, where are you? Well, we'll start with Albert, but we'll need a chair when he arrives. Okay, sounds good. So, hi, I'm Bill Hurd. You all may know me. Um, the bad thing about knowing me is you all heard my stories by now, right? <laughs> so last time I said, I'm going to bring you some new stories. Here they are. I brought you, how many of us? 12 new, new sources of stories here. So on my right is, uh, oh, this is going to happen. I'm going to have to remember names and everything. Von Ertwein, who uh, you may know wrote CPM for the 128. You did a bunch of early stuff going back. Uh, next to him, Joe Mishko, you did our Vax computers. You made it so we could work on stuff, right? Yeah, and also also worked on the Keithley. Uh, you okay. Know, doing, doing the uh, uh, parametric testing and at MOS, so. All right. Yep. Next to him, Dave Esposito. He was our Cal one of our Calma guys who did chip layout. Any anything you'd add? You were six layers back then. You're up to like 62 layers now. <laughs> it's, uh, what, 18 metals? Uh, we were at three micron right. transistors. I'm at seven nanometer now. It's, uh, we were at 10,000 gates on a chip. It's millions now. Very cool. Very cool. Next to him uh, is Hedley Davis. He did the Commodore mouse. He also worked for the Evil Empire. The Xbox. He did worked on the Xbox. Did all kinds of things on LCD. Uh, what else? I used to work on scales. I knew this guy before he worked at Commodore. I went and got my first job out of college, and I learned the fine art of lab pranks from this gentleman. Right here. <laughs> we tortured those guys. So yeah, yeah, we'll we'll be talking about those. So next to him, Dave Haney. Uh, the yeah, Dave Haney. Woo! Uh, Amiga C128 head. Definitely not worthy. So what, what have I missed? You, you just you did 10 years of stuff after I left, so I can't. Well, after you left, I, uh, I made, uh, I, I tried to make a, uh, a Roku and Netflix back in the late 90s that didn't quite work out. Um, we, we had the right ideas. We had the wrong decade. <laughs> um, I, built a, uh, I built the world's most advanced RC controller for dri driving your cars around back in the early 2000s. Um, I'm doing... Uh, more radio stuff these days for um, uh, like we, we did well, my company did the it just retired but we did the, uh, the the coach to coach radio system for the NFL um, they they just switched over to LTE this year and they're not too happy about it but um, they they're losing their frequency which is why they stopped using our radios I, I heard they yeah. were using Commodore 64s <laughs> it was a little more sophisticated okay. than that a little bit more. All right. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that's, that's, I, I'm still designing systems. Cool, yeah. cool. To his right is Kerry Sagety, who did the Amiga Genlock, uh, which was very cool. Think about the days of computers where suddenly it talked to your TV set and video sources and everything. Kerry was our comedian of the hardware lab, far funnier than any, anybody else I know, and also uh, an analog group guru. So very cool to have you with us, Kerry. Thanks, Bill, and I have some stories about you I'd like to share. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Eh, I'm the storyteller. <laughs> to his right, Benny Pruden. Benny goes back to, woo, Benny Pruden. Uh, there's Albert, all right, very good. So Benny goes back to Commodore uh, cash registers, did everything dealing with disk drives, what else have you? Uh, floppy disk, um, uh, also I did a disk controller for the C900. Okay, um, Z8000 for the rest of you guys. Okay, <laughs> and I was in the advanced R&D group where I had lots of little hobby projects that um, never really saw the light of day, except for one. Um, yes. Uh, I went out with a team of people to uh, buy Amiga. Uh, Right, right. <laughs> he, he purchased the Amiga. Or yeah, you were the team, the sandbox team. We called you that bought the Amiga or right. found it. Yeah. So. And Bob Russell was there too. Were you there? No. No, you didn't go. No. You and I, you and I went on to work at uh, Mars, and we had glamorous work on payphone stuff. Oh, you talk yeah. about high tech shit. <laughs> that was. <laughs> you haven't lived till you sat up at New York Tell trying to figure out why this thing on 50 miles of cable resets. <laughs> but you fixed it an all-nighter and it was up and running. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Benny used to talk about what it was like to have an 8051 processor running in a Coke machine 200 yards down a dock in a thunderstorm. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's your environment that he had to make work. Nice. So to his right, Andy Finkel, uh, who was head of the games group when I got there, and I only recently learned that you went on to become head of the Amiga software and everything. Tell us, tell us more real quick. Yeah, I, I work, I've been in software Commodore uh, Vic 20, Commodore 64, TED, uh, or which was named Plus 4 later, LCD machine, a little on the C128, not much. Uh, I worked with Benny and under Martin Shabilsky in special projects. I also helped uh, coordinate the Amiga purchase uh, because that's what Martin did. Right. Um, and uh, eventually went out to uh, work on software at Amiga itself with my team when we got traded to uh, engineering in some sort of uh, weird deal. Um, nowadays, I work on wireless mesh networking with uh, Dave Haney and Fred Bowen and a couple ex-Commodore people, as well as a whole bunch of people who didn't work at Commodore. And we are looking for people, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps saying that. Software guys, device drivers, Linux. <laughs> keep, me, keep us in mind. Yeah. So to his we, right. Now, now, now that's, this is how, uh, by the way, they're going to reimburse me for the trip. <laughs> so, to his right, Bob Russell. Uh, Bob, you're one of the original gangsters, as, uh, both you and Neil to your right. Um, what all did you work on? I, it's, it's so hard to find out because Bob is so quiet about what he works on, you almost have to beat it out of him. Well, when I got out there in 79 uh, at the original Commodore in Santa Clara, which was the second building they had, um, I worked on the original pet stuff, trying to clean up the basic and stuff like that, fix all the bugs that Bill Gates left in the basic. And uh, <laughs> then I did the graphics for the 8032 and the, and the new keyboard and stuff like that. So I go back to that era and worked on disk drives and debug disk drives. And then all the rest of the good engineers went off to work on the toy computer. And I, we got this board with a bunch of chips on it from Al Sharpentier and crew <laughs> from MOS, and we're like, well, we're going to make a computer out of this. And you only need 4K of ROM, you know, that's plenty. You can put everything into right. that. So I ended up basically shepherding that through without, you know, visiting engineers on and off when they're working on the computer they really wanted it to do. So I did the original 1001 in uh, Japan, and I kept really good notes, so Andy could later on, I think you did a lot of the programmer's reference guide, um, and that was my key thing, because I knew I couldn't figure out how to do everything, because I was totally out of ROM space. We didn't have enough RAM to do anything either in that computer. So, um, worked on that. I'm the one, unfortunately, responsible also for the super slow disk drive We're interface. We're going to be talking about that, yes. So, um, <laughs> And it got even slower when I did it in the 64 because some Japanese board people took off traces. Um, so then I went out. I was one of the two guys that moved from Santa Clara originally to the MOS facility because we were too expensive, all engineers, because we could walk across the street for $10,000 more. Jack was tired of losing people, and 
I was tired of having a new manager every time I <laughs> showed up at the office because I went on vacation and they'd actually gone through two rotations of managers. So they had no, had no idea who I was. So, um, But anyway, luckily I fell in with Al Charpentier here, Bob Yanis with oversight from Charlie Winterball, and we got to do the computer we really wanted to do because we were kind of going, oh, business machine will do, and we couldn't go faster and we couldn't do better graphics and we got to do whatever we wanted. We pretty much got protected and a lot of clever people, hopefully I'm part of it. Uh, I did kind of the software and integration, figured out how to put in a little glue chip to hold it all together and how to modify the code from the VIC-20 so we could get it done in, what, six weeks? I think we worked on the chips longer than that because yeah. we weren't quite done and we were quote done, but. Um, so that's, yeah. that's the Commodore 64 part. And then I went on and did a bunch of other things, started being the Z8000 business machine because I wanted us to go business and was part of us trying to purchase Zilog before basically Exxon snapped it up right when we had the deal. But we had a great deal on chips, so we tried the longest time. To, that's why we had Z80s, and that's why we had Z8000s in various computers. Um, very since, cool. Since then, I've uh, I've done a lot of specialized projects. I always after I left Commodore, I did a lot of uh, really really interesting tablets, uh, touch sensitive uh, stuff with neural networks, the handwriting recognition, built at the uh, DOS level because you had to be DOS compatible. Uh, helped get Amiga. Had a fun time. Very cool. So to his right, Neil Harris. Neil just gave a talk earlier. You were part of the original VIC-20 commandos? I was. I was hired in January of uh, 1981 uh, as, I think, the fifth member of the commando team. And Andy was the sixth. He joined a month later. Um, and I wrote the VIC-20 user manual and contributed to the uh, reference guides for the VIC-20 and C64. I wrote a few cassette games. And if you remember the cassette six packs, I wrote the blackjack game. and the Slither and Super Slither and helped with some other ones. Um, ended up running the Commodore Magazine Group for a while, the Commodore Microcomputer and PowerPlay. Um, did a lot of sales support. Um, and you can go watch my YouTube video and see the rest of what I was up to at Commodore. Uh, left for Atari, so I know this is a Commodore panel, so I won't talk about that, but. Uh, went to Atari, went to work at the Genie Online Service, uh, went to Simutronics, an online game company. If you, anybody remembers Gemstone or Dragon Realms, online text-based fantasy role-playing games, we've got a player in the back. That's good. He helped put my kids through college. <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm, um, I'm at Amazon Web Services as of last month, so I still have no idea what's, how it all works, but I'll figure it out. And I'm also on the city council in Gaithersburg, Maryland, so I've become a little bit more diplomatic in my later years than they remember me back then. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So to, to his right, Albert Charpentier, and I'm, I'm going to real quick gush on, 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 on some hero worship here. Because I've, I've told Mention uh, Pedal that I wouldn't have had a career without them, but I wouldn't have had my career without you. Because this Commodore 64 did what it did, opened the door, and a bunch of us walked through that door. So thank you very much. Albert Charpentier is the designer of the VIC-1, the VIC-2, the VIC-2. 20, you did the initial design for, and you did the design on the Commodore 64 with Bob Yanis' uh, assistance, right? I've got all that? You've got it. Excellent. Yeah. Round of applause for Albert Charpentier, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes. I, I, Tell, I, what have you been doing since? Wow. Uh, what have I done? Well, I'll, I'll just real quickly, I mean, I started out at Commodore in uh, 1974. And I was actually designing calculators, chip calculator chips. Then uh, I did RAM chips, uh, uh, ROMs and RAMs. I did the ROM that actually went into the Atari uh, Asteroids game for Atari a long time ago. That was the you know, 64K, and I needed 32K and there were two bank switches, and I put that in for Atari. Bits, right? Yes, bits, <laughs> <laughs> not bytes. <laughs> no, it was 32K space in the 6502, but it was, yeah, <laughs> funny. Um, so yeah, they, they didn't have enough space for that, so we did that. And then, um, then my passion was video, okay? How to control a TV set, and I love video games. 
And so that's what led me to do the, the VIC-20, or the VIC-1 chip, okay? And we wanted to sell that to game companies. Nobody would take it us up on it, and even though it was a pretty cool chip. And Bob Yanez came in and said, gee, can I do my senior project on this, what you guys did? So he actually took that and took the board I had and put a little operating system in it and turned it into a computer. And then we showed that to Jack, and that was the toy computer that Bob was referring to. <laughs> no, the toy was something different. Oh, was that was different? <laughs> yours, oh. yours came. Yours came. The toy was already in. in oh, I didn't that know that. that. Okay. The super duper. Oh, okay. Faster clock and all types oh, okay. of stuff. Oh, okay. Not not. Not that your, one. Not your economical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that led to the Vic 20, and. Between that time, I'd start, I really saw the, the, the problems with the VIC-1 chip and not being really powerful enough to do the kind of video games that I would like it to do. So that led to wanting to do the VIC-2. And that really then created a whole other product category with the sprites and, and things that I really said, wow, we could really do some really good damage with this thing. And um, by that time, though, the VIC-20 was starting to sell and so it really transitioned to the next generation video game to the next generation computer. And I think that that's when you were, you were involved with all of that. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah. well, we were gonna do the Max. Right, right. yes. It was, the, it was the game machine. Right, and, yeah, uh, yeah. It was like, why just do a game machine? Let's, let's do a computer, <laughs> yeah, right. Do something better. Yeah, so it was, it was a, it was with me, you, Bob Yanis, there was about a team of about eight of us in that group. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, we had, we had one guy that supported Bob and me in the lab. Right, and yeah. We were busy cranking, cranking chips, chips out. You know, Dave, uh, Jim Redfield and Dave DiOrio. Yeah. But so it was a small team of guys that were all dedicated to seeing this thing through. And it, at the moment, you don't know what you're doing. And all, all you're doing is having fun and saying, I want to do this. We were driven. And, and it turned out, and, and here we are 40 years later, and we're still celebrating with everybody in this team here. It's, it was it was a fun run, and it, yeah. it really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me here. Absolutely, absolutely. So, if, if I were to try and start at the beginning, who, who's been here the longest? Who, who worked on the pet? Any, any, anybody here? You. I didn't work on the original. I was one year later. All right. I went to college with three of the engineers at Iowa State University. And I was an 8080 guy, and those were 6502 dopes. <laughs> and, uh, but they hired me anyway. They invited me out the next year after the original pet came out because at that time I became a computer engineer and I had I ran the labs because there were no senior computer engineers. It was a new course, so I had pets in front of me and pets behind me in one of the labs I ran. And they brought me out to write test software, and it. It was the type of thing where I wrote a test program to test the pets. Right. It was so tough, it was failing everything because it was finding all the chip flaws and design flaws and stuff like that. So basically production said, get, get this guy away from us. Let him write, <laughs> let him write other software. <laughs> and so kind of early on, my first time there was like uh, a lot of debugging, like the new disk drives and um, so I, I knew how to, how to use the um, in-circuit emulation device, basically, that I can't remember what they called it at that point in time anymore, but I don't. it was quite sophisticated, discrete 6502 emulation that you could single step through, and it plugged into the chip socket for a 6502, so I got exposed to everything, and that's why when all the other guys went off to do the fancy computer, <laughs> I got assigned this little thing that came from MOS who didn't know what they were talking about at all, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, were the, we were the pariahs, right? <laughs> well, you did really good stuff when it worked. <laughs> 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 that happens to push the envelope, right? <laughs> so in 1978, I took a job at Mr. What? Calculator selling pets. And one okay. of the first things we found was um, you know, you could plug in an, an edge connector on the back and plug it into a speaker and amplifier and do a few pokes and play sound through the 6522 chip. Well, we did that with every new computer that came from Commodore because if the sound sounded terrible, then the 65, 6522 was bad and we'd use the chip puller and pull it out of the socket and plug in another one. So that was a slightly less sophisticated text than 
test than what Bob was doing, but we had to do that with every computer. That's one of the, one, that's one of the chips they told me. <laughs> Don't quit, quit testing that chip, it fails too many. <laughs> but, it, you know, we were pretty, st we were sticklers, so we made sure that every computer that we sold at least had a good 6522, even if we had to plug several in before we got a good one. The, the, uh, the person that's not here with us uh, today or anymore, Chuck Peddle, who uh, kind of, he, he came from Motorola with an idea that became the 6502, Bill Mensch, Will Mathis, other people came with him. And then he's the father of the pet. I've got that part cracked, right? Though I don't remember what pet stands for. Uh, Chuck told me, but personal electronic funny. transaction actor. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, Chuck would would. Right there on the front. Right. <laughs> but I don't remember because Chuck was funny. He was talking about pet rocks were a thing back then too. No, it's not the pet rock. You know. <laughs> to this day, to to the end of his life, Jack swears that it was because of the pet rock that they called it the pet. By the way. Yeah, Jack said yeah, that's the, part. The rest of was made up later. Right, right. So. So if we start kind of from the beginning, go ahead, Benny. Oh, the cash register was a derivative of the, of the pet. Okay. You know, we just put stuff around it, put a printer and a cash drawer and stuff. But it was a later design of the pet. And, and you came from Commodore, Texas. Right. As I had a Commodore dealership in Louisiana. And we did a, a basic program and put a printer on top of it and a, and a cash drawer and turned it into a cash register. And all of a sudden, we're the largest distributor in the United States. And you're like, what's going on there? So they bought us and moved us to Dallas to, uh, right. to productize it. You, you were just talking earlier one day, suddenly uh, 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 Tremel catches you and knows your name and everything and surprised the heck out of you? Or? Oh yeah, he, uh, it, it, it was later when I was at MOS, uh, I was working on what they called the, the cheap disc or the fast disc. And you know, as I was walking through the door, he, he broke off from the conversation he was having. And you know, I wasn't hardly anybody. And he goes, hi Benny. He goes, how's that fast disc coming? A cheap disc. I think he called it the cheap, cheap disc. disc. Yeah. Yeah, Jack's tr uh, priorities, right? But yeah, he, uh, he loved the engineers. Uh, but out of the cash register division, he fired everybody one day except for the engineers. Right, right. That was a... Uh, so, Albert, did he, did he love engineers? Did he love you? Oh, yeah. Well, he and I had a truce. I mean, we, we finally came to an agreement. There was one thing that I, he recognized that is that if he let me alone, I would make him money. Right. right. <laughs> Money that, is good. that was a good place to start, okay? Right. And um, I spent a lot of time with him in, it, from the VIC-20 years through the Commodore 64 at various shows and so forth. And, and he um, was an interesting character, as, as we all know. I mean, yes. And he would, he would make it known. He would have the, you know, the, the, we all heard of the jack attacks, right, where they, he'd yell at you. At the, and um, fired the receptionist when he walked in the door. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he was, my money, he was <laughs> tough, a bit, but again, he did like engineers because of the fact it was something he recognized that, that was, if he allowed us to do what we had and, 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 and really understood who were the people who were going to make it happen, he would give us free reign. And that's one of the things that, that you really hear, <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to set this shirt up. Jack had left and gone to Atari, and so we go to CES show now with our, our, the guy who used to run us is now head of Atari, and Andy's brother Steve came up with this t-shirt, it was the days of Ghostbusters, Jackbusters. Um, didn't we get told not to wear our Jackbusters t-shirts? I think we were threatened at one time, yes. Uh, oh, that's, a that, that's good. <laughs> like that. But Bill, I, I did see a picture of you making nice with Jack when he was on his deathbed. I think he was on his last months. And you were teasing him at some show about whatever. Oh, uh, 25th anniversary of the C64, which is 15 years ago now, right? Oh, wow. So, oh, you're talking about when I was going to take one for the team. Uh, the, so I, I'll tell a story real quick. Uh, I, we're in the CES booth, and the phone rings. Remember landlines? In a, in a booth, right, they, they cost like $1,000 a day. I answer the phone, and a guy's like, go over to the Atari booth and check out their printer. Well, we had had a meeting where they said, anybody going to the Atari booth is going to be fired. And it's like, and they almost said, even you, Bill Hurd. You know, they were, they were looking at me. <laughs> So I'm like, I don't think that'd be a good idea. And the guy got, it was a marketing guy, by the way. He got belligerent with me and, and said, don't you know how I am? And I'm like, no, but okay, I'll go. So I walk over to the uh, Atari booth and down the step comes Jack Trammell with Sig Hartman, 
uh, Shiraz Shifty, Tom Brightman, all the all of those people. And I walked up and shook his hand, said, "Hey, you know, ex-employee." Good. It's the first time I talked with Jack. And as Fred Bowen put, as all these people were clustered around me, that's when you reach in and pull the pin on the grenade and take one for the team. You know, just one to five, good ratio, right? So that's the story you were talking about? Okay, I, I got you. Yeah, you said deathbed. Of course, Dave Haney's got a video called Deathbed Vigil. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, it's free on YouTube. Now. Oh, cool. So you can Google that if you haven't seen it. it yeah, that's, that's um, a bunch of us are in it. Yeah. It was, uh, it was the last, uh, last few days of Commodore Westchester. Right. And the, the way I summarize people from Commodore is we're all a pretty sad group. Um, you know, we had the world in our pocket at one time, and it just kind of, the way it went wasn't the way we would have wanted. Everybody knows the name Apple Nook because they're still around, but uh, we're, nobody knows who we are anymore. So we appreciate you all having us here at the 40th, 40th anniversary. So what, what is the question, what's that? There you go. How many t-shirts did you bring with you? So uh, technically, I think Andy was the person that worked at Commodore the longest. Weren't you the person that worked at Commodore the longest of all of us? Or, or Russell? Oh, probably Russell. I, Bob. I started in 81 and left in 91. So. I'm trying to do the math. Hang on. It's, it's, let's see, it's decimal. Uh, but it's in, in Commodore years. It's in, yes, in Commodore. I had hair. That's how, yes, that's the effect Commodore has on Hair. Yeah, yeah Commodore. <laughs> everything was Bill, so Bill, who handed the keys to QVC is what I want to know. Who, Say again? Who handed the keys to QVC when I moved into that plant? Yeah, that I, was I, the I, worst day ever, the worst. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 that was, I was gone by then, but yeah. It, it, what, what a sad feeling, you know? I just wanted oh. to burn it at that point. Yeah. Being from Detroit, it comes naturally. That, yeah. you know, when, you, when you don't see something you like, you burn it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I used to work at Cooper Trauma Center in Camden. We had a thing called, uh, what's the day before Halloween called? Uh, Devil's Night. Devil's Night, yeah. And they would set fire to all the buildings, and we'd take all the burn people in and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so before the, uh, 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 after the, the pet, I'm still trying to figure out the toy and the Ultramax. Who did those? What was the order? Where did they come from? Because uh, Albert didn't remember the Ultramax, but he had an Ultramax mode in the C64. And I know that because I have an Ultramax mode in the C128, us and Dave did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically, the Vic era, Vic 1 and, and Vic 2, where we're, we really got involved in the computer side of Commodore. Because when Commodore bought MOS technology, Chuck moved out to Santa Clara. Yeah. So that was that separated out the MOS division from the computer division in Santa Clara, right. which is where Bob started, okay? But then as we did the VIC-20, or the, I mean, the VIC-1 and turned that into the, the little computer we did, that's when the power shifted back, right. okay? Mm -hmm. And so, but I'm not aware, I mean, I thought that was the toy that you guys were referring to. I didn't know that. Uh. Uh, the, uh, the toy computer was a... a T-O-I. T-O-I, yeah, tool of idiots. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I called it, at least. Um, they took all the good engineers, and that was going to be kind of an integrated computer that was more business-oriented and used other people's chips, like 6845 and, and things like that, and had like a real... Uh, real chips for things like serial bus and items like that. It was a lot more sophisticated right. computer, and they were trying to get the 6502 to run at 2 megahertz in that. That was on their, their list. I don't know if they ever achieved it, because I showed up at a show in uh, New York with the VIC-20, and, well, VIC-1001, right. and that was all she wrote because Jack understood how much the TOI computer was going to cost versus the VIC-1001 and that he wanted to sell a computer and scare the Japanese out of the U.S. market so they wouldn't come over and that was the whole reason for the VIC-1001 why it was first it was to keep the Japanese from introducing computers in the U.S. market mm. and he introduced the price kind of before he even knew <laughs> much about the Japanese market or the U.S. market 
He just wanted to scare them to death, so they wouldn't come in, and it, it worked. You survived an incident with Jack Tramiel. You uh, told me about one time, you, uh, somebody had told you to counter ship a VIC-20. Do you remember the story? Yeah, it was early computers. They would put you on the airplane to take them to places. And I was told by management not to get on the airplane, instead to ship it, and it didn't show up for whatever reason. And Jack Tramell came and ripped me in his office for, <laughs> oh, I don't know, half an hour it felt like. Uh, and everybody was like positive I was fired. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Tramell, and I'll never do that mistake again. I'll do exactly what you tell me to. <laughs> walked out. I was fine. <laughs> so yeah, the story I heard is he walked out and turned left instead of right to leave, to go out the door. He went back to his desk, and everybody's like, He's still with us. And we called him the golden boy after that because he had this glow. And, and it was useful. You, you could say, well, Bob said that uh, Jack said, and you could get away with almost anything because he, he had survived Jack. Yeah, it's, Bob was one of the first people I knew at Commodore who had one of the Jack I win cards. Jack what? Ja uh, there was a, look, a card. Uh, it says Jack I win. So in, in any argument with Bob, you could say, you know, you're arguing with him, and he'd pull out his Jack I win card and say, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, right. I, uh, uh. <laughs> and, and that's one reason we did cool stuff like the yeah. Commodore 64 is because it's like, uh, we're not going to go up against him. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. That, was, that was true. I mean, because you, once, you once you got Jack's ear and you got his approval, it only took that one approval, and then you would always, I were going to counting, and, and they would say, well, I needed something done, and they would go, well, you, we got to go through process. I said, listen, I can call Jack now, or you can do it now. I, I have a JTI win card. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and then he would go, okay. <laughs> so you and I were talking, I, I would talk about things that were urban legends. And we had an urban legend that you guys had said, you, you, you had this Vic chip, and you couldn't sell, or you, nobody wanted to buy it, whichever one. Nobody, Mattel, Coleco, nobody, nobody looked at it. It's yeah. crazy. And, and so you guys build a system to put it in and set it on. And, and the way we tell the urban legend is you set it here on the table. Tell us about that. What was that yeah. system and what? Yeah, well, it, as I said earlier, Jack, um, Bob Yanis took that as a project. I had built, I had a small computer working with 6502 that we were using as a demo for the game machine that we were trying to sell to people. And Bob took that. I was hiring him out of Villanova at the time. Right. And uh, he did that. He took it and put a little operating system at his senior project. So when he's finished, this is May or June, he comes in and he has his, his senior project. So Charlie Winterbull, myself, we look at this thing and we go, wow, this is pretty cool. So Jack is coming in a couple of weeks later and we present Jack with this computer that Bob did as his senior project, showing him that you know, it can type and things like that. And that became the VIC-20 and Jack just went, I want that, we're gonna do that. Right. And he called Chuck, and Chuck was pissed. <laughs> he was in charge of the, Chuck was in charge of the toy computer. That was his. He had a whole engineering group off in a separate building. And <laughs> he was not happy with me. <laughs> right. yeah. And uh, he, uh, so, because Jack saw this as, wow, this is cheap, and this is something that can really do. And then they turned into the 1001 that, that started in Japan and then became the VIC-20 internationally. But uh, it was sort of was the demise of the whole pet thing at that point, you know. So how did the 64 happen? Because we heard, I heard almost a similar story to that then. Well, that was one where, okay, it, having no success at getting companies to buy chips, because I was in the chip division at the time. So we, uh, my goal was to get silicon sold. And we had no success at the VIC-1 chip, even though uh, during that time. So we started working on conceptually what a VIC-2 would be to make it a more powerful game machine. So during that time, I was working on the VIC-2 chip and, and moving that forward. That's when the VIC-20 exploded in sales. So it became clear that, all right, the right answer is take this new game machine and let's turn it into a really powerful computer. And that's when the team came together because it it, we just, it sort of was just done. I mean, the fact was is that, that we, had, we had shown that the VIC-20 could be useful, and Jack just let us run. I mean, right. it really just happened over the fact that, oh, we're going to do this, and we said to Jack we're going to do it, and he just said, 
keep going and go do it. Right. And, and Make that's me what money. happened. Go do it. Yeah. Yeah. So someone had asked earlier, um, and they weren't able to ask you, can you elaborate on the aborted attempts between the VIC-1 and the VIC-2, they say the 6562 to 6564, these, these chips were aborted to introduce interesting reasons. Do you remember anything about that? The which ones again? 60. The 6562 and the 6564, something between the VIC-1 and the VIC-2. Now, they're really, I mean, okay, there's, there's really the VIC-1, okay, and then there were a couple of versions, because remember I had the, okay, where, where it comes from is that the original VIC-2 chip was running off the color clock, 3.5 uh, times 2, okay, so roughly 7, and it had, the problem with that is when you use the dot clock for the black and white and the same version of that clock for color, they bleed together. Okay, so that was the original 6560, okay? And then what happened was is that I was, that only gave us about 36 characters on a line, I believe, and also had the shimmer. If you put ones and zeros next to each other, it would turn into a color. And you can see this actually on some of the Apple products, this, this <laughs> bleed between there. They, they call it color, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's their color, right? Right, right. So. It really annoyed me that we had this. Now, so there's a couple little corollaries here. The first chip that we did came out of FAB in November. It didn't work. We quickly debugged it and using a micro manipulator with little probes and so forth. We got that out to the FAB. They worked over the Christmas vacation. We got that the very early January. CES was a few days later. It worked. And off to CES we go with this new chip. We're at that chip and we're at CES and, and I was really, I didn't like the, what the shimmer problem that we were having, not even a shimmer problem, but it was just the, this bleed between the color stuff. So I get back and we, we now, I, I make a change. Okay, and that became I think the 6562, the next version of the thing. And I went to an 8.1 megahertz clock in order to separate the black and white from the color. Well, I didn't know something. If you have two separate crystals, they're going to beat against each other. And when we plugged it in, it came out of fab. It had the shimmer in it. And it was unbearable. I mean, right. you, you couldn't make it work. It would just, the, the screen would just sit there like this because the dot clock and the color clock were not synchronized. So there's a gentleman, remember Bob Simon? I don't know if you remember him. He was, Bob Simon was a guy that came out of Motorola that worked for their um, uh, cable box division. And he knew about phase lock loops, which I didn't know about. Okay, so we put a phase lock loop in there and we ran off of the clock so that the color clock and the dot clock, we actually eliminated one crystal when we created the dot clock out of the color clock and then that became the final version that went into production. Okay. 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 And I will tell the one thing that we're, Jack was so mad at me for doing that because he said, you almost killed my company if you didn't get that to work. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're saying. You're saying he was mad. Oh, yeah, I got, I got you talk, yeah, I got the jack attack on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so was some of that dot crawl the reason why the, the later Commodore computers had separate luminance and chrominance to the monitor to, to kind of spruce up? Well, that? That, was actually a, that was actually a decision earlier on because of the fact that I would, I mean, NTSC was certainly, using it on a, on a, on a home TV was painful. And I always knew that having separate chrominance and luminance would actually create a better screen, but you needed a monitor to do that. Right. So that was actually an original part of the specification to put that in because, again, it, you wanted a better screen than what your home TV could do. So that was really an early on desire to have that. Okay. So one, one of the things that I always think of with Commodore, the power we had, because we not only made the computer, we made the monitor. Well, the 64 did have a slight delay issue between the chroma and the luma. There was just a slight difference. And they fixed it in the monitor. So when you use a 1701 monitor, that's been tweaked to make a Commodore 64 look good. So, it, I mean, and why do that? Because we're Commodore. We can, you know? So, Benny, you talked about, well, I think it was you talked about a Tiger team at one time. Do you remember that? No. To I... fix, like, the sparkle on the 64? Well, that was a different issue. Right, right, but I'm kind of leading into that. Didn't you, were you part of the Tiger team or? No. All right, well then I'll have to tell, but I thought it was you that told it to me. 
So after Albert's time, they got a team of people together to uh, address things like Sparkle. Does anybody else know this, or am I just making this up? I know uh, the Sparkle problem. It was right, there. Right. When they heated up, it was a right. problem. <laughs> so one of the things they did was the Sparkle, you know, on a Commodore 64 screen, it's light blue characters on dark blue. And you would see these light blue sparkles all over the screen. So one of the things the Tiger team did was they made it so that in cells that didn't have a character, they would turn the foreground character, uh, color to dark blue. So now it's still sparkling, but it's sparkling dark blue on dark blue. So and it was a typical Commodore fix. I mean, it was just, I loved it, right? So go, go ahead, Neil. So I'm curious about something. While I'm up here, I'm going to ask a question. So when we first got the VIC-20s to work on and create software uh, as part of the launch team, uh, we thought this is the hottest computer in the market because literally if you try to remove a cartridge from the back of the computer, you would burn the heck out of your hand. <laughs> Who, how did you guys fix that? What, I mean, it was really ridiculously hot. And what was done in order to cool it down? You're talking about the VIC-20 or the 64? The VIC-20. So but Bob Russell one day said to me, yeah, that was my, pr my fault. Is, is that true, Bob? You, you, the... That's not Bob. <laughs> no. <laughs> I've made too many mistakes. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't, I, the answer, I don't know what was done to fix the VIC-20 heat problem. Other, uh, does anybody else know what they, there was... Well, the, the VIC-20 the Vic always had the heat issue because we had to put that massive heat. Didn't we start a fire? We could. Um, those, those actually were, I had to go do fire investigations, okay? And those <laughs> almost always were people put the power supply underneath like full length drapes to the floor. So they had no way to do it. It was their own the fault from, then. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't even the computer that caught fire. It was the power drapes. supplies that caught yeah. fire and <laughs> burned the drapes. So, um, but no, it's, it's like the original VIC-20 had just a little, well, the board I got from Alan Crew. Um, had a little heat sink and it would rot off the board after you ran it for you know right. a couple days, so we put the super robust heat sink in and the only place we had space where okay. there was any ventilation in the case was where the cartridge came and went, and we put a great big three amp, you know, it, it regulator on that or thing. something, yeah, and so you could pretty much use any sloppy power supply that the Japanese or anybody wanted to send over and it would regulate it. Well, you know, what, however sloppy that power supply was how much heat you generate. Right, right. And uh, later on, I don't know how they solved it later on because I was like, the 64, we had better solutions as far as power supplies. So. Um, Probably bought better power supplies. Let's, let's talk about better power supply, yeah. Better external yeah. power supply. All right, who here knows the story of the Commodore 64 supply, the potting that's inside? Y'all always ask me this every, every show. Who, who was there when they potted the Commodore 64 power supply? Bob, were you, you know? I, I was there, but uh, you know, as long as it worked, that's all I cared and Jack cared. So. <laughs> who, who came up with it? Was the Commodore Japan working with the vendor? That, that's what I always figured. Yeah, when I left Commodore in September, um, it was moving out of the Santa Clara manufacturing right. facility over to Japan, okay? And in Santa Clara, they, had, they weren't potting them. They were not potted at that point. So that happened in Japan when, when they took it over there and cleaned it up. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and I, I, I tell people it's to hide our sins. We slow down the act of catching fire, but eventually it catches up to it. It still has to get to the final temperature, and now you're just drying out the capacitors and everything that go with it and everything. But it, it, so the short answer is we did it because it appeared to work good enough for us to keep, go, keep selling computers. Keep, keep banging away. At, at yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We had some reliability problems back in there. <laughs> so, does anybody have any uh, a story spot like their first '64 or the first time they saw a Commodore computer? I want to get you guys talking here a little bit. Go ahead, Kerry. <laughs> First time, I, I remember the tractor trailers full of them, the failed units, because you couldn't debug them fast enough. The right. first time I saw that, I thought, holy shit. And it was like, oh my god, what, what are we going to do with these? And there was a debug team for a while that was going to try and figure out what was wrong with them. And I think we just sent a Dewey pile and they ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. So, Did you know what happened to those? Because there was like three or four tractor trailer loads yeah. full of... Okay, anybody else had the tractor trailer story? Otherwise, I'll tell it. <laughs> 
So we, the Commodore uh, uh, culture was to ship it for Christmas. I mean, and we shipped and shipped and shipped. And I, I can tell you stories about where skids of broken units just disappeared probably into shipping to be shipped. So we shipped to make our numbers for Christmas, we shipped to the 18 wheelers in the parking lot. You remember the, the big fields of, eight, of yeah. tractor oh, yeah. trailers? Oh yeah. And so they, we shipped them, they're still on the property, but we shipped them, right? <laughs> well, they go to open one of these one day and it's empty. Well, the uh, Commodore security guards had gone into business for themselves and were selling Commodore 64s on the open market, so. <laughs> The, That's terrible. <laughs> my, the, my other story along those lines where the FBI got, because the FBI gets involved, right? The other one was the QA department um, was doing something where they ha were having units shipped to their house. And so that was their way of getting them out of circulation. Well, I had made a deal with the QA department. I would go down there and give them data books, and they would give me IEEE 488 cables for the disk drives. So I go whistling down there one day with a, you know, my data books to give, and the place is empty, it's been cleared out, and it's like FBI around, and I, I'm just like, no, nothing. I, I, I'm not here to exchange goods with the QA department. So, who's got a story? I want to hear a story for somebody. Go ahead, Bay. So one of my favorite stories was I had recently transferred uh, from Dallas up to uh, the MOS facility in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, Bob Russell calls me into his office and he's gonna teach me about uh, disk drive code. In particular, he had a little project he was working on that um, the 1540 uh, floppy disk for the VIC-20 was not compatible with the Commodore 64. Uh, we had to slow down the clock so it was compatible. There was a uh, 40 microsecond DMA that occurred that would stop the microprocessor period and we had to use a software clocking mechanism. So you know, we had to slow down the clock to I think it was like 60 microseconds. Yeah. But you know, Bob showed me exactly how to build this whole thing and um, and uh, how to back up the source code and and make me promise for the production and stuff. So it was remarkably slowed down, but it worked. You know, it was flawless the first time he, he typed. You know, he built it. It worked and stuff. But from there, I went into Charlie Winnable's office, who was my boss's boss's boss, who ran MOS Technology, and I got on my hands and knees and begged him to not make us screw up the Commodore 64 because there was a fix uh, that Bob explained that we could do. Right. The, the, uh, the problem was with the 6522 and the 1541, the hardware shift register didn't work or it had a glitch to it. And, um, but we could at least, you know, when we're laying out the Commodore 64, it had 6526s that would work in the hardware shift register. And the, the fix was to you know, wire or the, the bit bang port to the clock serial port. Uh, and eventually, you know, we could change the software in the Commodore 64 and have a, you know, a disk drive that ran eight times faster. And, but I, you said it was Japan that laid out the board and missed the trace because they thought. They painted over the traces. They took it off, they took the yeah. trace off because they thought there was you know, two traces going to the same line. Yeah, and it was. Same place. Yeah. Two, two traces the same place did not fly with them and they, made so many boards that Jack wouldn't let me change it. And one of the reasons I gave Benny that code to finish is I was working on this 6526 variant of the floppy drive and I had, I was working with the, uh, oh, the lab guy. No, 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 no. Tim Bickey? Tim Bickey. I was working okay. with Dave and Dave, Dave was one of these guys that magically cut boards using his children or something. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they, you'd say, oh, we need this mod or whatever, and they'd show up and, you know, I'm not sure what slave labor was involved, but I had that, I had the board, I designed a mod to the original one so we could use that 6526 with the correct traces, and then when we weren't allowed to it, I was like so mad, I think, I think I found the listing recently, but I'm pretty sure much I threw out the Wow. prototype boards because it was like ah. right so the problem with the serial bus so here's the answer to why is the serial bus slow and then I want to ask Albert you, you Albert had a chance to fix it and was shot down too also that's why I understand but the 6526 was a hardware shift register and why do a hardware shift register? we're Commodore we make our own chips we can do a hardware shift register but we're also Commodore we make our own chips and we made the chip has a little problem and that is, when it's an input, it's high impedance. When we flip it to an output, that glitch that they said would occur, and everything, on, not everything, but the serial bus would lock up. And uh, uh, now, so the, the 
story I heard, the urban legend I heard is Jack said, it'll be right here come Monday morning. It'll be fixed sitting here on my desk. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that was you went in and fixed it in software, right? Well, I, I think I had at least a week or two. Okay. Well, I heard weekend. Because uh, it's, it's the type of thing where I was... I went in and was talking to Bob Fairburn, who was the guy working on that side of the software, and was like, it, it totally locks up. I can't do anything. And he's like, oh, it's that 65, 20. well, you'd think you would have mentioned it before now. Right. <laughs> so Jack shows up. It's like, we're going into production in two weeks or whatever it was. So I need the final ROMs. I need all this stuff you know, before we go into production, and that was why the slow serial bus came about, because I needed something that worked, right. and I had to test it. I was the only guy working there on the VIC-20 at that point in time, so that's why it came up, and we had the beautiful opportunity to fix it, and... And blew it. We, we were our own worst enemy. <laughs> so bad. That was so yeah. frustrating, wasn't it? Oh, that was... So, such a slow drive. It was really frustrating. But you were doing a fast disk drive interface. Correct. I wanted to work on one, yes, because okay. that was one of the things we wanted to put in a chip because of the fact that I recognized that a slow disk is a really bad idea for a computer. <laughs> and Even though the cassette deck works really well, a slow disk right, is still yeah, a bad it's, idea. It's really a problem, and, and, and the fact is is that the Apple was around, and we and they had the faster disk on the Apple that, that I really wanted to get that level of capability into the Commodore thing. But with these disk drives that we had and, and, and the boards, uh, I was, we said, I, that was shot down. That was, we were not allowed to do that one. And, and so, yeah, Charlie who who shot, shot, shot down you down? Who, who outranked you in the company that Charles, could shoot it was, you it down? Was, it was actually, I, I never got the full story who shot that down, whether it was somebody in manufacturing and all these disk drives. The story I got was that they had a ton of disk drives that they had built for the VIC-20, and they were sitting in a warehouse and they weren't going to let me change them because of the fact that they had to get rid of these other drives, and if, this, if I, we do this new drive, then this, all this stuff is going to go in the toilet. Okay, right. So that was the excuse I had. I never really got the real story as to whether that was the truth or not, but that's what filled her down to okay. me. Because I, I never, wasn't sure if it was a marketing issue or, or it was an inventory issue. I never really was able to separate. Well, the same thing happened to me because Charlie Winterbull agreed to let me work on a fast disk. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would plug into the cartridge slot. Yeah. It right. was much cheaper. Jack called it the cheap disc. <laughs> but other people called it the fast disc. Right. And I got the prototype working. Uh, and, um, and it was much faster by having it plug into the cartridge slot. Uh, but it got killed. Yeah, and it was odd that, I mean, it, that was one of the things that was uh, a cultural problem is, is that I think most of us around here recognized that we were building a computer that we wanted to be a better computer. And there was a group that sort of didn't understand that having a faster disk would make it a better yeah. computer. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of frustrating from that perspective, but uh, right. yeah, I, I mean, too. yeah, and yeah, so it's just an odd thing that I, don't, I never understood who was behind that. I mean, I almost felt like it was Chuck Peddle making it so it wouldn't, wouldn't go. Making <laughs> himself known through, through Jack, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so that, that was one of the things that, that, that happened, yeah. but, uh, you know, we sold how many? 27 million of them? Right. Yeah, right. Uh, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say the, the fast disk and slow disk things just kept repeating, too, because there, there was a fast disk for the plus four that right. was never finished, never, never productized. It, never it was finished, um, never sold. And just to make things even, um, we had a slow disk for the Amiga 4000. Okay. So the, the normal. Amiga 4000, 880K disk um, was controlled by Paula, and it was done with uh, a full track reads and writes and blitter decoding and everything. And um, for the, the 4000, we still had the same Paula chip and still had the same disk speed. So um, some magicians in, in uh, Japan came up with a, with a drive we had asked for that would run at half speed. <laughs> so so uh, it would do twice the density, but um, no faster, so the effect was, of course, that it was slower. <laughs> and so I didn't know who, who knew that Amigas also had a slower disk. Um, but yeah, it was. I guess it was just a Commodore tradition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, was, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, you, you heard it here from me. Uh, yeah, Apple did did us. They they beat us on that one. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Now, I'm going to pick on Dave Esposito here a bit. Yeah, man. Did, now, did you work there at the same time as Albert? Al hired me. Yep. OK. Um, I, I can remember my interview. Um, I thought I was coming in to do PC boards. Um, Al introduced me to Mike Angelina. He's no longer with us. Uh, Mike's doing the interview, and he takes me into the room. I see the three layout tables pushed together and this huge drawing on, on the table. And I just stopped the interview, and I said, Mike, I said, this is crazy. I said, I've done PC boards in school on paper. You know, vellum. I said, this is an ink drawing. You know, it's huge. And he goes, that's what you're here for. We're going to teach you. <laughs> so we, we continue on. I go back into the camera room, and I see this plotter e -e -e -e, starting to print out. And he goes, I said, you didn't draw that. He, said, he goes, you're learning already. <laughs> <laughs> and needless to say, I got the job. 41 years later, I'm still doing layout. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I learned a lot from Mike, obviously. He's, uh, he was very good. He told me himself. Um, he did. He, he said he was the best. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, he, uh, yeah. And that, that plotter, they would move it to, if you were unfortunate enough to sit near the plotter, it'd be like, yeah. ching, ching, oh, that's all you ever heard. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, it would run out of ink. I was just getting ready to say. So our ink budget must have been crazy because we never wanted to reuse the ink pens. They were just you know little three inch. You drop them in, but you always wanted to put a new one in. Yeah. You didn't want to get halfway through. You can't reprint right. it. It's yeah, never going to register it itself. Yeah, everything would be off. And that's how we used to check. I mean, now everything's digital. It's online. It's crazy how many. I can run 10 million gates through DRC and. 20 minutes. DRC, what's yeah. that? <laughs> and, and back then it was Something asses and elbows, right. is what we called it. We'd do the printout, the, the one I saw during the interview. And we did literally, someone would be up on the table, leaned over, ass in the air, elbows down, yep. tracing out gates, and someone else would be looking at the schematic. Yep, okay, next. Call it out. Yep. And, and call, call and check. Exactly. <laughs> and that's how we did DRC, LVS. And, right, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. By hand. By hand. That's right. So I, I had heard that you all would kick off your shoes and crawl up on light tables. It's, and somebody's like, you, you can't be on a light not, table. No, it, it was would the break. drafting tables. They were yeah. not the light table. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, the light table was for playing pinochle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we would play pinochle at lunchtime. And it was a big light table. Now, how'd you do your data entry when you first? So the, as we're saying, this is a day when we're, it's all. I don't want to call it manual, but it feels it manual. Was manual. It, yeah. no, it was manual. No, it was. So when I first started, yeah, nothing was 100% on the computer. First of all, the Calma stations were expensive. Yes, very. So what they had was they had, uh, what, two GDS-1 systems, which were just green. Data generals. Screens. Yeah. And then we had uh, two color stations and a uh, uh, digitizer, big light table. Anyway, so yeah, I was, I was taught, you know, we're drawing them on gridded mylar, well, yeah. and then one cell at a time. These days, I got millions of cells in libraries, but, and they would take it in the other room. Someone would digitize it in. They'd have that in the computer. You put a bunch of these together, and boom, now you have a data path. Right. It was one cell at a time, and, but and, yeah, they were done by hand. And, and you were using the big plotter off to the side and then went to tablets, or how'd that? Well, one person was using the digitizer, but yeah. So in other words, we would do it by hand. You'd take it into the back room, and at the time, it was Jackie. She was digitizing stuff in. Eventually, we could all digitize in. And then even after that, we started actually doing the layouts on the screen, I mean, at the station. But at the time, the machines were very slow. I mean, very slow. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it was possible. And then, of course, we moved on to the VAC system. We, uh, uh, things, well, incrementally. They got faster right. and faster. Right. So you're able to do bigger chips, more. And then, of course, DRC became, what, ECAD. I think it was. Right, right. Uh, Dracula. Yeah, we built better computers to make better cat. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's yeah, self-perpetuating. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> so uh, yeah. we, I was going to say, we got VAXs then. You just pointed at Joe Mishko. Joe was the system administrator of our VAXs, um, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It's, uh, you, you're who we I took care of the PDPs. I took care of the VAXs, the Apollos, uh, you know, all of the... Uh, uh, and eventually the uh, the sun some sun work stations and and thus and such. Uh, what uh, what Bill learned is uh, a Vax eighty six fifty is probably the best hair dryer 
that could possibly <laughs> exist. I had long hair. Bill, Bill would, I, I'd come in in the morning, right, I'm a, I, I was an early riser, would be out in there in the morning, Bill's in the bathroom splashing water all over saying, do I stink, Joe? Am I, am I, I you know, my girl, and your girlfriend used to, used to come and steal you because you would never go home. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I taught him about the, uh, the, the Vax 8650 hairdryer. It works, right. it re worked right. really well. Why, why did we have to reboot the hairdryer every day at lunch? <laughs> uh, it, basically because, <laughs> because it really was not as great of a machine as... Okay. Uh, uh, it, it, the it, file it, got scattered or something. No, what, it, yeah, what ended up happening is it was, it was uh, resource leaks uh, because, right. they, you know, you, uh, it, there, were, there were always memory issues that would, that would come up. Do, do you remember the air conditioner fiasco? Uh, the, we, you mean the flooding of the air conditioning no, we, system? No, I, th I think they found an air conditioner uh, sitting outside in the junk pile and thought they'd put it in first and found out that it was sitting in the junk pile for a reason and they had to buy a real air conditioner. That, that's right, it. that's right. We, had, we Actually, we had the two air conditioning units in the computer room. Right. And uh, uh, you, you, you actually recognized that you could go over top of the door or underneath <laughs> the floor if you had to get in and and bounce the vax as well, you know in the evenings and uh, he would he would do that I mean he and, and and he'd say you know had to do it yeah, yeah. right well well I have a Headley story I'm going to pick on you Headley and then I'll give you a chance to pick on me back if you want so one one night I go in and. The locked door to the VAX area where you guys kept all the, the management terminal stuff, the door is laying on the floor. <laughs> and I look in there, and in this red, dim glow, I see Headley at, at a terminal, and the, the tapes are going like this. And you were loading Adventure. Uh, you, you were trying to decrypt a, a game tape. Do you remember doing that? The story I remember about Adventure was when we worked at the scale company, oh, yeah, I brought a, a printout of Adventure. And we did our group meeting, and I sat there and said, I got this printout of Adventure. We can type it in. And the boss was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and forbade us from touching it at work. And then two days later, the boss calls me into his office, and he's like, hey, you touched this. And he calls up Pip on this PDP-1123, and it had fingered me. It said I had touched the file, That's and fine. I had no explanation. And it turns out it was him, and good for him. <laughs> no, 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 no. He went in and told the boss and said, no, man, it was me. It wasn't him, you know, so that was cool. <laughs> but, but I have no recollection of yeah, the story. You, you had tapped out the, the hinges of the door. Yeah, yeah it, uh, that's what I was just going right. to talk about. Uh, it, you know, I don't remember who disco discovered that the hinges were on the outside. On the wrong side. Head Headley discovered and, that. And, yes. and you, he you, you knock the knock the pins and the hinges out and take the door off if you wanted to get into the computer room. Right. So there it's laying there like just boom and you hear cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching, coming out and there's Headley like I don't even think you had your shirt on. You're just in there at the computer at like three in the morning. It was like I was happy. He, he was. <laughs> he was. He was in his happy space. It's uh, You didn't feel like climbing over the wall? Warm and cozy. No. The uh, uh, So Bill lived work for a while. What's that? You had a air mattress under your Yes. Under your desk. My my record was eleven days without leaving. But yeah. I, I took showers. That, that made me different than some of the other people that stayed. Because yeah, Joe would tell me if I smelled bad. And, and then I would like react. But I would actually have to, they would turn off the hot water at night. And uh, I would have to get my bin and go over to the vice president's coffee machine and fill it with hot water from the coffee machine. And I would go do it. And you did not want to walk in the bathroom at 6 in the morning because I really was in there like, you know, cleaning myself out of the sink. A absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, we, we used to take bets as to whether George Robbins or you would go home first. Uh, <laughs> George actually lived he under lived there, his, though. He so, lived yeah. under his desk. When they, when they took uh, his, li uh, his driver's license away, he would ride his bicycle, uh, uh, you know, in, in stay the week, and then ride, at, uh, ride home. I took him home once because I felt really, really sorry for him. And... George lived in a train station. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and on the first floor of the train station were all of those Exxon uh, Unix Z9000 Z9, yeah. uh, you know, machines. And it was everywhere. And he, he, just, he just 
would sell them, you know, and... Little Unix machines to take over the world. That's exactly right. That's what he, his intention was. So, um, we have ultimately got a, a photostatic plotter. And, and we were in uh, hog heaven for a while, you know, as opposed to the pen plotter. And we had to learn the hard way. The plot would come out first all skewed. We had to learn to set the paper out so that the humidity would get to it and everything, you know, and, and it, because it was drying out as it was plotting and it would stretch. So one night, and I used to preach, don't mess with stuff you shouldn't be messing with. So one night, I broke my own rule. I ran, we ran out of red ink in the photostatic plotter, and these inks are just, these, these are indelible inks. So this, 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 I went to do something with the red ink tube to either change it or something, and the tube popped off, and it's pulsing red ink like it's bleeding, <laughs> right? And this stuff's going everywhere. And it gets on my jeans, and it gets on my hands, and I track it down the hallway to the bathroom, <laughs> stain the sink with this red ink. Everybody comes in the next day and thinks somebody got seriously injured on the job or killed, and they start going, where's Bill? <laughs> so, it, yeah, and I had to say, yes, I messed with the plotter. <laughs> that last bird bath was tough, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing, I mean, I didn't know you could stain porcelain like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, uh, who's got a story? Anybody want to jump in with one? I, I have a personal story, Bill. I, I came in one morning, and I wasn't part of the, the development of the 64, and I came in at, towards the end of the 128 before they shipped me out to Los Gatos to work on the Amiga. <laughs> Bill was sitting at a prototype board with um, scope, one scope channel. And he's flailing his hands, cursing like a madman, and he's tired, right? Now, you've got to admit, this guy is a role model for everybody that worked there. It's a commitment. If you haven't gotten his book, you should read it. i give you a selfish uh, plug for your book. Thank you. But he, uh, he was on the wrong channel. I walked over the scope, and he said, <laughs> I got this goddamn problem. I cannot find this. And you were working on memory share between Z80 and 6502, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And the scope was on channel two. And I said, Bill, Lay down for a while. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I think I did. <laughs> I I wasn't the only person who used my air mattress. I'd walk in the office and somebody'd be asleep on the, on the off in my own air mattress. So I'd be real quiet, not to wake up the intruder in my office and whatnot. So we talked about George Robbins a bit ago, who was the other person that had long hair and also stayed there. Anybody want to tell George Robbins' story, or I'll tell the nesting story, or anybody got one? George did the A five hundred, by the way. So he did. Was that the first Amiga? Do we call that the first Amiga? No. no? I, I don't know my Amiga. Amiga 1000. Amiga, uh, yeah. Oh, it, the Amiga 1000 was the first Amiga. Okay. That, was, that was the one that was largely that was designed out in, Los, in Los Gatos. Okay. Yeah, Dave Needle. In fact, um, when we were doing the C128, Dave Needle was out in Westchester, and he came by to look at the C128 board. I was, like, working with the 64,000 station or something. He comes by and I'm like, hi. And he's like, I want to see what components you're using, because so they were doing the last the last Amiga motherboard. They wanted to make sure we were using, you know, that they were that they were up to par on Commodore production or whatever. We, you know, just so. But yeah, but the uh, the the 500 was uh, the second one, okay. and the first one done in Westchester. Right, right. That's and that's that why was I thought it was the first. Yeah, one. yeah, that was the one where the the. Um, Bob, Bob Welland and, and George Robbins had come up with this idea of sucking all the fat into Agnes. Okay. Um, which was all the, there were buffers and Gatorade, uh, buffers and, and uh, PLDs, PALs, around the, uh, the, the main chip that dealt with m moving the CPU bus across the, um, uh, to the chip bus. Okay. And it was, it was fairly expensive just because PALs were expensive. And um, they actually had, two solutions. They had done the Fat Agnes, but they were concerned about the size of the chip. That was always one of the biggest chips we had anyway. So we had a second chip called, the, they were just called the Fat Chip in mind, which had all, which was just a big glue chip that would have replaced, um, which would have, re, which would have been a standalone chip had Fat Agnes not worked. Okay. Yeah, uh, but that was, that was the whole, that was the whole idea of making a, making an Amiga that could that Commodore understood? Okay, okay. At, that could sell at those kind of prices too, and that was just a piece of it. I mean, George. I mean, uh, Jeff Porter did crazy stuff with 
getting prices lowered on floppy drives, getting prices lowered on power supplies, the whole, just the whole nine yards. There was every single piece of that machine was, was, cost, right, right. was cost optimized. So George yeah. was yeah. the other one that stayed there long hours. And whereas I slept on an air mattress, George would sleep in a pile of bubble wrap under his <laughs> desk. And, and you'd go looking for George and you'd see this bubble wrap with like an ankle sticking out of it and you'd know you'd found him. And then later he'd be walking around and he'd have all these red, little red circles all over his face from the bubble wrap. And so you knew he had just woken up. Yeah, I, George, oh, and George also would not go to any meetings in the morning. Uh, it, he, he, the rule was if you were going to schedule any time with George, it had to be in the afternoon because he would work all through the night, night. into the dark. And, and then when the sun would come up, just like a vampire, he would go hide under his, yeah. under his desk in the bubble wrap. Yeah, uh, and, and at some point, George had, George had actually optimized this where he moved, he built with the Herman Miller, Miller partitions, he built sort of a separate area that could be darkened, and that, was, that, was, that, became, the new, that became an even better nest. Right. Um, so that, was, that, was, that was with the door, too. Yeah, that was with the door, too. So he, and and, and he, could, he had some, something hanging over the top or whatever, so even light didn't come in. Yeah, so so he could so you could look in his office and even under the desk you wouldn't see him because he'd be off in that room with the door shut. <laughs> he'd be hiding. But he was really committed. There was yeah. Uh, yeah. There's one more. There's one more thing with. Uh, there's one more thing with uh, George. Uh, we had one of the computers, CBM Vax, which was not under the control of right. the system administrator. That was George's thing, and it was the uh, it was running Unix. And uh, Commodore didn't know it, but it was one of the main backbones it was between you, uh, the U.S. and Europe. And George did that behind the back of uh, nobody knew why the phone bills were so high <laughs> except for George. But it would, was yeah. carrying massive traffic at that time. Um, yeah. And if anyone, uh, anyone knows about that internet emulator, uh, there's an, in, an emulator of the internet at that time, which is still floating around. You can run it on your browser. George is still logged in. <laughs> wow. And you can actually chat with That's him. spooky. Yeah, it, it definitely is seeing his name there. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of our uh, lost brothers. George also taught me the whole A500 design. Uh, we, we, when I, was, I was originally maybe going to take over the A500 because George had been the high-end guy. He had been doing the, the Commodore 900 slash the 8000, and I was the, the, the remaining senior C, C128 guy after Bill left. And... Um, he sat down with me and taught me the. Went through, we went through the whole thing together, and then he's, you know, and, and, and basically he he didn't want to give up the 500 because that was his baby. So I ended up taking off the two, taking over the 2000, okay. having almost no idea what I was doing at that point. Um, and you know, and he he was he was there the whole time, you know, answering questions, helping me through. Um, we sat down and, like I mentioned before, we did the we came up with the video slot, just to make, you know, to, to offer some additional stuff you might be able to plug into the machine. Okay. Yeah. So, Carrie, uh, Carrie Sagety is a, I, I think of you as a broadcast engineer or an and, uh, yes. analog guru. NTSC, what's NTSC stand for? They were the same color twice or something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and so Carrie did the, the Genlock for the Amiga. Now, so that would have been the 1000 that you did that on? or It what? was some version of it. We worked on Agnes, Daphne, and Paula. And I remember, with, you know, you talk about unrolling those, those sheets of the chip. And much like you, we did an all-nighter once because we were coming up on a show. And of course, we wanted to show you have the chips out there. And the, we got a, a wouldn't it be nice uh, speech from Jay Miner, who at that time was running Amiga. Now, Jay, just a little history Jay Miner designed all the Atari chips. It was, it was such an honor to meet him. But we've, and we're looking at this big raster generator, whatever it was, and we're, we're figuring out where can I put in the color frequency of three. 0.58 megahertz. Where can I force a reset of the horizontal scan? Right, right. Where can I force a reset of the vertical interval? And we kind of redesigned. I forget which chip it was. You, which did the timing? Uh, that was that was Ag, uh, that was Agnes. Agnes. Yeah. And uh, it took like two days, and it popped out, and the, and the damn thing worked. But until you could get in there and really do those kind of handles into the system, Genlock didn't have a prayer. And, and Bill, I worked on the C64 trying to get that to Genlock. Tell him. And we talked about the clock. 
<laughs> right? It, it, it's nice if the clocks are all synchronous. It'll yes. Take, <laughs> yeah, it helps. Fun things like dot crawl and, you know. Yeah, it things. helps a lot. I, so, I learned that lesson. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, well, Bill, Bill you, you, mean, you, you took, after I left, you took over the next generation right. of the Vic chip, really, the, 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 we made it into a 48 pin. And how did that, how did you, how did that happen? Oh. Um, <laughs> Jack Tramiel left. That was the, that was Followed how it started. Me, yeah. <laughs> after yeah, after after the plus four, and the Amiga was coming, but there was this time where nothing. We didn't have anything for CES, and uh, I, I got with Fred Bowen. That's how it started, and we started working on something, and we said let's let's make it C64 compatible. We we had taken a ribbing on the plus four for incompatibility. And I, I was like, I, I had a woman tell me, it's like, I wrote software for over like nine months and it won't run on your new computer. And my thought was, if we can give that back to the community, if, I can, if we can give them more C64 compatibility on the next one, support the people that supported us, right? So that's kind of was the idea behind it. And um, we had something brand new to us. We had 48 pin chips I that know. Dalbert didn't have. They didn't exist. I really no. love that 48. So when we said, hey, we have this 48 pins we can put in, we put the BIC chip in there, and we started making it do 2 megahertz mode. We, we added as much to it as we could without busting the die. You know, we just did it around the edges of it. Right. And the reason why the 128 came to exist is nobody stopped us. Yeah, uh, that's a, that, was the that was the best thing about Commodore at the yeah. time, right. is that if you started on something, as long as you, were, you flew under the radar and when it finally bubbled up, it was good enough, then it would go. But I mean, it, you had that freedom, and that's, that was one of the things that I think made Commodore really fun to work at. Yes, you were yes. at that yeah. level that you go, okay, I want to go do this. And if you had the, the push to do it, nobody really stood in your way. It didn't matter standing up and doing it. It was fun. When, when we showed the 128, we were showing a 64 game, so it wasn't anything new. But the 64 is, you know, color, light, sound, and they're showing, we're showing a 128 doing it, it's half wire wrapped, and they're like, oh, this is great, let's build it and stuff. So, but all I'm doing is showing a 64 game. But it <laughs> impressed management so much that they, they said keep going on Go it. Go for it. So, yeah. so then it, yeah. we didn't set out to put a Z80 in it. Um, Z80 is another processor, right? We had a CPM cartridge that drew like an amp and a half when you plugged it in the 64, which meant the supply got hotter and would, the voltage would get lower. And when you plugged it in 128, we had two of these cartridges in, in, in R&D, and one didn't work. So I had a failure rate of 50%. One didn't work in the C128. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to work. So I also I didn't like the fact I had to support an amp and a half. I didn't like the fact it didn't work. And we literally overnight said, let's move the Z80 out of the cartridge, put it on the board. We didn't tell manage about, management about it till the PC board was cut. And now the Z80, we even made the Z80 do something so you couldn't just take it out and have it still boot, right? <laughs> so we've, we, we it, and people ask, why didn't you make it a DOS machine? I never even saw a DOS machine at this time, right? But I had these Z80 cartridges I had to make work, and these, these cartridges took an amp, more than an amp, but uh, only 200 milliamps if I put it on the board, so CPM was born. How did you get involved then? Because Vaughn here then made CPM work on the C128. Yeah. They, the management did something right. They reached out to you guys yeah. and what got you involved. Was I was at Commodore working on miscellaneous projects. I think I initially was working for Bob. And one of the projects was they had a, this CPM cartridge for the 64. And I had implemented some CPM systems previous to that. So it was like, oh. And the problem was, and I'm get a little technical here, but the program space that they called the TPA was small. And the max you could get was 56, 52K. And I think at Commodore, it was more like 24 or 20. It was, it was low. It, you could run small programs, but if you had a big program, it wouldn't run. So one of the early things I did, and I don't think it ever even got released to the public, but I, the, the drivers to make the video work, the drivers to make the keyboard work, all that stuff, are the operating system was at the top, then the drivers came in, and then whatever was left was your, from the bottom up was your TPA. And transit program area, that's what it's called. And so I had moved the code 
that makes all those things work, instead of doing it in Z80 code, instead of mapping the screen in the Z80 code, I moved it over to the other processor. It's like, why, it's got its own memory space, so why limit what CPM can do? It can do it over there. So I ended up moving stuff over, and I think I ended up getting up to around 48K. The best you could do was 52K. And I got up to about 48K, and I guess people there saw it, and they, were, they liked what they saw. So I was a consultant at the time, and uh, I had gone to another assignment, and all of a sudden I get this phone call, and they wanted me to come back. Now, I lived up in Newtown area in Pennsylvania, and Commodore's way down in Westchester. It took me an hour and 15 minutes on my best days to get to work, and about the same to get home. And it's like, I don't want to do that again. Uh, it's, it's like, that's, that's a tough ride every day for months, and it was coming into the later part of the year, I think, when I got the call. And they said, well, would you work with us and, and help us get somebody else able to do this? You have the, not more knowledge than anybody else here on what's going on in this thing, and can you come down? So I said, oh, I'll do that, and I'll come down for a week or here, you know, a couple of days here and there. And they brought in, I came down with one guy, and I think they had another guy that I never really met, they brought in, and they finally got back to me and said, you know, we, we've tried these other guys and, and nothing's working. What, what would it take to get you to do this? I said, well, if I don't have to come into the office every day, I'd be happy to work. I don't mind coming in when I need to, but I don't want to be doing that drive every day. So that was the arrangement. I started working on it at home, and that was before. That was Nowadays, before everybody yes. telecommutes. Back then, it was unheard of. I mean, this was unheard of territory. Nobody could work from home. So I basically... I had a CPM system that I had designed at another company that was working at home, and it had eight-inch disk drives on it. So when I first started, I said, well, I didn't have a 1541 working, so, and I basically, the first thing I did was did a UART to my system, and all the disk commands, I broke BIOS so that if it wanted to block a disk, it would go over, it would transfer, it's very similar to the way the 1541 works, much faster, though. <laughs> and so I, I got up the system within a couple of days. I got a system up and running, and then I was off developing. So um, one, of the, one of the problems that existed back in the beginning was there were hundreds of different CPM systems. And every single one of them had a different disk drive, and every one of those disk drives had a different format. Some had 10 sectors, some had 11, some had nine, some had big sectors, some had little sectors, so then they would go to 23, and, and, and then they would, for speed, they would say, when you're writing, instead of going write one and then instantly write the next one, there was always this turnaround time to get things working, so what you start, they, different vendors tried to get their, their drive to be faster, was they would skip sectors. So, and some of them physically numbered them different, and some of them would actually just use the number, oh, we're on one, the next, the next right you do is gonna be to four, and then the one after that will be to seven, and then the next one, you know, on and on. And then they would interleave it around the disk. So anyway, it got real crazy. So that was probably one of the hardest parts of the whole job was yeah. just managing all the different disk drives. The video interface wasn't, yeah, wasn't too bad. That. <laughs> um, that, I got the video up. Uh, there was all kinds of, back then there was uh, ET100, was a color terminal. Right. And so it had color commands, and we had color on our screen. So I implemented a VT100 emulation so we could do that kind of stuff. There was a number of different things that I had implemented and put in the BIOS. And because I had two processors, I could ship load to the, the Alien, I'm like Bob, I started in the 8080 world and moved into the 6502 world. Um, and the 6502 just never really cut it, but it was really, <laughs> it was really a good, I don't wanna do this, give it to him to do. <laughs> and it would save where you, so you could use that to save space in your code. And you could 
pass a function off. And oh, by the way, CPM had some things it was fast at. And the A60... 8563? 8563. I can never keep track of the numbers of the product. So, well, and, and Vaughn didn't try and keep track of the, the rev number. Oh. So we had this 80-column chip for the C120. You may have heard of it. And, and so the way it worked is this, this, we, we're doing CPM now, but it, this was an opportunity because that meant we had 80-column code right away, WordStar would yeah. run, and we would, on day one of the C128, because of CPM, so now it's come full circle and we're going, we need CPM, oh, now we need the 80-column chip to work, which that thing was just, just a bear. Un un unlike Albert, they, the engineer didn't understand its use in a system, right? So he w we went through a lot of revs of the chip, and it was heat sensitive, and so what this guy did here was he learned a trick. You had an R3 chip that he liked, it was his favorite one, and he would take the... It worked. <laughs> he had a Mr. Popcorn hot air butter popcorn popper. He took the butter warmer dish out of it, would set an ice cube in it. Perfect and, size for it. And set it on the chip. And, that, and he would get, you get 20 minutes per ice cube. Uh, yeah, I'd just uh, have some ice cubes on the counter and I'd run it for a while and then I'd pop a new one in. When I start seeing the sparkle or the characters pop up in the wrong spot, and uh, just because I figured this is something they're going to fix. It turned out it was a metastable data condition uh, that the guys in Texas had. I don't think they ever heard of it. I don't think he, they he knew did, what it he, was. He did not try and fix metastability. Whenever you have two clocks, as, as Albert yeah, was talking. Yeah, when you have two clocks, they, they do this. And it, if, if you happen to hit it wrong, you don't have enough setup and hold time on your signal, and you get the wrong character right. gets latched in. It, 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 it doesn't know if it should be a one or a zero because it doesn't, it's not sure. And so you would get a a wrong, it would misfire. Right, so the other, one of the other bugs, uh, if you heard us yesterday talking about a Texan register, because the engineer was from Texas, and he, he, we learned that if you wrote the register twice in a row, it would work better, that metastability would have less, so we called it a Texan write. We forgot to tell him about it, all right? <laughs> Meanwhile, we're on like Rev 6 or Rev 7 of this 8563, and he's back on Rev 3, where this bug doesn't even exist. As they rev this chip, Bugs got worse, not better. That was our clue, something was going on. Yeah, I just saw the face, yes. Yeah, it's supposed whoa. to get better every time. So we show up at CES show, Vaughn shows up, and he's like, well, I've been working on the R3 chip, and when we ran his code on the R5 or 6 or 7, whatever it was, it would leave characters behind, and it looked like the Matrix. And this is the 80s, and it's <laughs> crying. The terminal looks like it's crying as it scrolls. It's leaving characters behind. Oh, but the, the way a screen scroll worked, because there's no such thing as, as an interrupt. Copy by software, not even DMA. Right. No, no, you, you didn't do that. You had to physically, if you did a scroll, you had to take the top, you know, the 24th, 23rd row and copy it down to the 24th. Take the 22nd row, copy it down to the 20th. Anyway, you it got was, what I'm it saying. It was 256 and you had to bytes. Do all of it. And so right. those would have rights that didn't occur. So as you were rippling it down, you'd left garbage behind. Yeah. And oh. It so, so it's the night of CES show. Suddenly, a third of the booth is dedicated to CPM. Yeah. And so we show Vaughn what's wrong. We say, we need a double write here. And Vaughn sits down. Vaughn did not have the computer with you to no. compile CPM, but he had a disk editor. So he sits down the night of CES, a Commodore disk editor, figures out the new commands and uses a disk editor and writes them to the disk. And in place of, he couldn't make the code get bigger or smaller and you had to re-hand calculate checksums, mm -hmm. and the sectors were recorded backwards in addition to the, the other thing was backwards. So you had to do all this but by But if you hand. know all this stuff, you just map it out and you do it. So You, do, you just do it. <laughs> so Vaughn well, saves CES, basically. The simple solution was this routine that was here that was this long need to be this long. There wasn't enough space for it right there, but there was... At the end of the sector, there was some space that wasn't being used. So you put a jump instruction here, and you put the code over here. You hand code in the new byte you need, but now you need to put it in the right spot, which just took a few minutes to figure out where what the mapping, because you know what the mapping is. You just work out the mapping. He makes put it, it sound in, simple. And then you do the, it was a simple checksum, not a, a CRC, which would have made it infinitely difficult. Right. So it was just summing up all the characters and putting the right number at the end, and so it, 
it probably took maybe 10, 15, maybe a half hour. But the, the first thing was understanding what the problem was. Because right. that week, at first, it was like, what's going on? Nobody, you know. Nobody told you. Nobody yeah. told me. And then Bill looked at it and he goes, I know what that is. We need a Texan right. Yeah. <laughs> I go, what's a Texan right? Oh, <laughs> you haven't been around for a while, have you? Yeah. Because I was busy turning on the CPM as Bill was fixing all these problems and, and fighting these problems. Bill was soldering wires onto the cap of the chip and because that was connected to the substrate and, oh, and yes. putting a different bias voltage on it to shift it so that they'd run at the right speed. I and grounded out the substrate, you know, the number one notch. Yes. I soldered a wire to it to the, VC, to the ground pin and I just grounded out the back bias generator and the chip worked better by grounding the substrate. Oh, geez. And the chip designer was like, you did what to my chip? <laughs> you, you'd have thought I had stolen this chip. I button. fixed it. <laughs> but it <Yeah>. works now. <laughs> and he's like mad at me because I'm abusing his chip that didn't work, you know? <laughs> and if it shortened its life from 20 years down to a month, it was fine. We only needed to work for one weekend. But, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of that, making, making it work for the show. Well, it was true yeah, Commodore fashion. You're done. And that's, that's why I tell the Vaughn story. It was true Commodore soldier fashion. He just did it. Yeah, so you hear him say, I just calculated it. It's not <laughs> and so, um, Anybody got a story? I'm, I'm running out of the story. Yeah, Benny. I got another story. Um, so eventually I got into the advanced research group. The care was that. Also, Bob, I think you were too. And, was, for, yeah. and you were the we're always advanced there. research group also. So after Jack Tramiel left and, and went to Atari, uh, one of the things he did is he put down some money to, uh, to this company, Amiga, to put an offer to, to buy them for 30 days you know, to hold. And, and basically, Jack was just kind of waiting for that to expire so he could, you know, after he came on board, to uh, try to, to get it for a lower price. In the meantime, they, they flew a lot of us out there uh, to go evaluate this, like two days before this 30 days came up. And, um, and yeah, we flew out there as a, a team and looking at all of the three different ships, and, and, and we were just crazy about how good they were doing. We were thinking this is the next generation Commodore 64. And uh, I don't know if you guys got anything to, to say about that trip we took out there to, to buy Amiga. I gave a talk on that yesterday. Did yeah, really? he I did. did. Yeah, I, the, the thing I had was is that the head of engineering at that time said, go out and figure if there's anything worthwhile getting. And I like called him back like the first time I could reach a phone. is like, don't let Jack get this for nothing. <laughs> so. yeah. right. Right. Anybody have an Amiga story? I remember the, the first time Martin was, I think, the director of engineering. Right. And he said, Carrie, I need you to go out to, to Amiga. And he says, oh, by the way, it takes two, two suitcases. Really? Yeah, I says, fill one with pads and pencils because the guys hadn't been paid in I don't know how long because they had run out of money. It was a perpetual problem right. in, in, in that company. And, uh, and oh, hey, here's some money, here's some checks. So I took checks, I took pencils, I took pads, and they were so grateful when I got there because nobody had been paid in like a month. And it was like on a shoestring. And I don't know, does, how does that compare to when, when you, did you experience that? Andy? Yeah, yeah, I, I experienced that. They were, well, the first time I went out, we, we were in negotiations with them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing our due diligence. So they were actually, uh, they saw the light at the end of the tunnel. They were really happy to see us. Yes, <laughs> it, it, like the relief team is here, yeah, finally. Yeah. And, and the, I guess, side of thing. The only thing that really impressed them and made them happy about being by, by Commodore, except for the money, was uh, Jack Attack. They loved that game. They play that, <laughs> they play that constantly. Maybe it was the title, I don't know. But Which I thought Jeff Bruett had, had written, and Jeff corrected me. We, we, we purchased that game from right. somebody, the Jack two, Attack for the plus four. We got it from two kids in Canada, yeah. Oh, two kids. That's their name, two kids in Can from Canada, right? Well, they were like 17 at the time. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we added new levels, and you know, uh, and then we ported it, kept porting it to other machines. They didn't but, yeah. call it Jack Attack. Right? No, they did not. <laughs> yeah, that would not work. <laughs> but but we called it Jack Attack. Yeah. Yeah. We actually we actually had a game on the market called. Jack, uh, no, no, that, that, that was it, the game. Did no, we was, sell it or we, it, we just demoed it? No, we sold it. Okay. It was a popular game. I have a I have a cartridge in the box still set. I found the unwrapped one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, 
for it if mine said so. I, I think I posted uh, the original name and uh, the level editor screens on the, uh, in our Facebook group. Right, right. So I wasn't around after the 128, but one of the machines that you guys came up with was the CD, what was it, the CD32, what was that thing called? First, first, CD, first who, was CDTV. Who did the CD32? Well, first was CDTV, which was a Don Gilbreth, uh, Gail Wallington production. Okay. Uh, Amiga-based, uh, just with an integrated CD uh, meant to compete against Philips' uh, CDI machine. All right. Uh, Carl Sassenrath did uh, the uh, advanced graphics. Uh, you know, I ended up doing user interface, uh, various things. But it was basically an Amiga with a CD-ROM. Who, who did the hardware? Don, I think. Oh, no. Um, no, no, that was the drive. Uh, remember the uh, Don's engineer, uh, Steve Kreckman? No, I don't. I don't. OK, well, Steve Kreckman did the hardware design. OK. Yeah, please. I, I want to tell a 3DO story. It, he I, worked on the Xbox, by the way, too. I worked in, in addition I, to Commodore. I worked at Commodore. I worked on the CD TV CR. I knew about CDs, and so I ended up going to work for 3DO. And 3DO had this terrible problem where Matsushita was selling the CD ROMs, and they were paying eighty dollars a piece, and they needed to do it for like thirty-five dollars a piece, which I knew how to do, which is why they hired me. And <laughs> uh, we, we go, and, and, and they're launching, and they're still using the old drives, and there's a problem, and we get all this data, and we hop on a plane, and we go to Japan, and we're sitting in this big conference room with the big projection screen, and I'm showing the data about why the boots are taking twice as long, and you know, you're killing us here. <laughs> and I take a break, and I go to the men's room, and in the men's room, there's this wall of CD TVs, <laughs> all this junk <laughs> that they had built that was left over. So I had a little bit of a difficult time convincing them that I was legit because I had come from that world. And they're like, we lost a lot of money on this. <laughs> and they were not happy, but anyways. But oh, cool, cool. Yeah, like I said, after my time. So, Jeff, any questions you can think of or? Hold on, there's uh, one in for Al from on YouTube. Uh, what happened to the Brazilian PAL M VIC 2 chip? Was it canceled due to Brazilian market conditions? Okay. Due to oh. heart attacks, I think, of trying to yeah. design the chip. <laughs> well, we did, I did the NTSC version and I did the PAL version. Okay. Okay. And the C cam was something that I did not do because it was not easy to put into the chip. And I think you ended up working D on that. Diorio. Right? Yeah, Dave Diorio did. Because right. so, I left right after the whole, right at the Commodore 64 went in production. I went and started my own company. But uh, I left these guys with a little bit of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, you, you did the C cam, right? Or did that? It, but Dave Diorio. D Diorio. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. So that, that basically. That had a lot of, from what I understand, that had a lot of hurdles that had to be overcome. Yeah, strangeness. Yeah, yes. yeah. I don't, I don't know the details of, of what created well, that I, problem. Well, I think it was like wax on, wax off for Dave then, because he had forced him to climb so far into the Vic chip mm. that when we went to do the 128, he 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 was you then by that time. Yeah, he, he was. There was the a lot to learn in that thing. Yeah, I, I don't I, want to say you know, he learned it was everything, about, but you know, th yeah. over the period from the Vic one to the Vic two, I was, it was a three year of, of video experience plus the other stuff I had, but right. so there was a lot to learn to get into that chip for that thing. But realistically, it was only going to be all the all the counting registers and had to go and change every one of those, make another version. Right. Yeah. Right. But it was set up for Why that. Why don't we take a some question questions? From the audience. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to oh, start. Do you want to do a microphone? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to start. So Phil Donahue here, everybody. Okay. Phil Donahue. Who, <laughs> who can um, have has a story about? the quote, real reasons that Chuck Peddle died. There's all kinds of rumors, flo Ch not died, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chuck Peddle left Commodore. Like, you know, there's rumors that, that the VIC-20 pissed him off because he wanted to go a different direction. It's a story I've heard. Is there something else that maybe you could say? Okay, so I was one of the people Chuck asked to leave to go form the Victor Corporation with a lot of the original hardware engineers. Um, yeah, the VIC-20 really did tick him off because they had, like I said, they had a totally separate engineering building, whole team, all their own equipment. 
that were working on the toy computer. And they really thought they were going to get permission to go ahead with that when we went to uh, a New York meeting with basically up investors slash, I'm not sure who all was there, board of directors type of thing. And so, and Jack immediately jumped on, let's go cheap, which is what he wanted. And he had a reason to go cheap, which was to knock out the Japanese. So the toy totally became a, you know, afterthought. And so those engineers weren't happy that were with him and they wanted to go do their own machine basically. And, you know, so I did go up and have sushi with him and the rest of them and up in Scotts Valley, California. And, you know, he was, he was upset at how he'd been treated because he had some options stuff that didn't come through from Jack. Jack was always great at making promises. Like he was, he, he offered me his Ferrari if I worked for free for a year. So I really thought about how can I live for a year to get a Ferrari. So, I mean, he, he but, you know, he, he would make things and say, like, you know, I'll give you a dime or something like that. And I'm sure he had done that with, with Chuck on pet computers and stuff like that, where there was some type of, you know, if this is successful, you'll get something out of it. And I'm sure he found some way of not, not paying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he made offers like that to me and always like, yeah, I, you know, I'd rather collect whatever you give me right now. <laughs> Did, didn't Chuck leave, go to either Atari or Mike? Where'd he go? And then he came back and then he left again. Well, he, he might have he had some in-between time because I'm not quite sure where he was when I first started there. He wasn't around. Right. And I don't know if he was at MOS. He was at MOS until 70, well, the Commodore bought MOS in the late 76. Then Chuck moved out there in 77. Okay. Yeah. So there, he was always part of the, the, that transition. He worked for Commodore. But then he was there, and then, and then he started Vector. I don't know if there was a time Leaving, there, leaving he, he might he might have had something in between. So. Yeah, that was yeah. me. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I, my memory is he talked about doing something for, I, I want to say Atari or Apple. Oh, it was Apple. He, he did something. He worked for Apple for a while and then came oh, back. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I'm no, pretty okay. sure. Okay, so. I did not know that. All I, all I know is he was back with the company by the time I did the VIC-20 because that I had to figure out how in heck to make the cassette work. Right. And he had written all the cassette code and didn't. There was zero documentation in any of that code. So it was one of those things where he and I had to figure it out kind of at the same time. So Yeah, that confirms another thing that's been said about the cassette code being there's no documentation. So yeah, that was that was Chuck's true. Yeah, he was not good at documenting things. I had heard he sat down with an oscilloscope and a terminal, and any time a programmer sits down uh, not a programmer, but an engineer sits down programming with us an oscilloscope. That's scary. Yeah. <laughs> so can I talk about the cassette for a second? <laughs> so so at one, you know, we had done two six packs of cassette-based software for the VIC-20, and uh, and and Mike Tomchak said, "Okay, Neil, go find us a vendor that can produce them fast because we're getting a lot of orders and we can't make them fast enough." So I sent out copies of Commodore cassettes to a bunch of uh, reproduction houses that did music, and they came back with samples. Then, like nobody could get it working because we were doing square waves, and that's the opposite of what they're trying to do in music. So finally, I've had one vendor that could successfully get us cassettes that actually freaking worked. So we gave them the contract, and then they did a batch, and they sent them back, and like most of them didn't work at all. I didn't know if the samples they sent had been created on pets or what, um, but they kept back, batch after batch that they sent us didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, and I'm tearing my hair out, uh, which is why I look like I do now. Um, <laughs> and finally. Some sales guy said, look, we've got a bunch of orders for these. We're trying to make our numbers for the quarter. Ship them. And I'm like, I think 80% of these cassettes don't work at all. And they said, well, with the margins that we make, it doesn't matter. We'll still make a profit if, if we get 80% of them back. So we shipped them. I mean, the guy at the reproduction studio had a heart attack during all this. It was terrible. But whoever wrote that cassette code, Chuck Peddle, OK, he's no longer with us, so I can blame him. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it was not meant for mass reproduction, right? So the company that, that Neil's talking about is Corey Sound. <laughs> and uh, there, we, got, we got the cassette routines actually working well, reliably. 
when we told them, just fully saturate it. And uh, that magically made the cassettes actually work. All right, that was after I gave force up and somebody else did it. <laughs> yeah, force, force that square wave. Force that square wave. Give them enough data so that it, it works. The, the routines actually picked up the edge and uh, loaded the data. But it, yeah. that's not something music people usually do on their tapes. <laughs> so at, on the other end of the timeline, does anybody know some interesting facts about why the C65 was considered and then dropped? It, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to answer. It, it was never was. really considered. It was a passion project by one guy. Yeah. Right. Uh, one guy who uh, basically controlled every aspect of the C65. And it was never meant to be real. So one guy, this is like good Commodore, one guy got Commodore to produce and engineer and build a couple hundred of these things, huh? Uh, about a hundred, yeah. It, it was yeah. busy work also, right? Yeah, yeah. It was never meant to go anywhere except for this one guy. It was his you know, life's work. I, I would have loved to have worked at Commodore. Uh, <laughs> no, that's yes, not, that's not really yes, true. Come on. There, there was a system engineer on it. There was the chip guy. There, there was layout. There was a, a bunch of people that worked on that program. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. But it was only Bill. It was his. Uh, yeah. Not not me, Bill. Some other Bill. A different Bill. Yeah, Bill Gardot, right? The force of nature Bill was. So there's already so much published about how tough uh, Tramiel was to work for, and yet also was the driving passion for the company. So when he left, and because it was so abrupt, did the rest of the management, that team that didn't ex escape with him, was there any outreach made to the engineering staff with the, look, we have products to ship and new plans, please don't leave, or any incentivizing? Because you know, you, if the if the entire core leaves, the company you know, comes to a screeching halt. Was there any outreach like that? I, I'd say the people that left were already thinking about leaving. You, you know, it, it was, I don't want to say us and them, but I, I don't have a good answer for that. Anybody else? Um, I, I work closely with a lot of the guys who left um, that were engineers, and we were very much well, we'd been forced to use Zilog chips because originally we were going to buy Zilog right. until Exxon snatched them out from under us. But we had a great deal where we got chips super cheap, so we still had to use Zilog chips for future stuff. Well, most of the guys that left, and me included, wanted to do a 68,000-based computer because we felt that was more in nature, and we could never get the 6516 kicked off which was, the, which was what we really wanted to do, but nobody would ever go for it. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that, it was like a group left, but it was not necessarily the group that was doing the Commodore 128 that were working on the, on the other computers. And in fact, like my group, which was the, the Z8000 at that point in time, based machines, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, it was bad, and they definitely wanted some people to come with them, but they didn't really necessarily need to outreach because a lot of people had enough of Jack, I think, in some respects by that time. And we also had totally different management that we saw day to day. Jack did not show up in your office at that point in time anymore and do a Jack attack. That was earlier on that that would happen. So. But wasn't the PC also, the IBM released that chiclet PC and that was coming on and people thought that was going to be the best thing ever. The PC right. Junior? Yeah. PC yeah. Junior? I'd be in PC Junior. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. um, I, I have another question for you from uh, YouTube. Uh, were there any plans to do an IBM AT version of the Amiga side card? I had none. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I don't remember. I, we'd, we got the sidecar. Do you, do you remember done? any of it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think the, the sidecar itself was really an A1000 thing. And by the time, you know, by the, really by the time I think they had debugged the software that went with the sidecar, the A1000 was kind of in the rearview mirror. Um, 
they were considering that as a, you know, that was, that was something, there were a few people within the company at the high level who thought that was gonna be important for business, but that's really where the A2000 came from, is the A2000 was solving the PC problem in a, in a better way than the sidecar did. And so once, the, once we, you know, in, in 86, 87, we were doing the, 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 the 2000, you had, you just needed a bridge card. And there were, you know, they had a couple different bridge cards over the years, but it was, it was, it was a simpler thing to do. And um, a lot of people who wanted to expand Amigas might have been a little interested in, in x86 compatibility, but that wasn't the only thing. And the sidecar kind of, kind of fortunate in just having one add-on or maybe a skinny RAM card or something there. So it wasn't, you know, the, the 1000, unless you put on an expansion box, wasn't really, you know, wasn't, wasn't quite what they really wanted when they were thinking of the sidecar. Um, it, it just, you know, I think a lot of people thought it was kind of clumsy too. It's just, and you know, again, the software, you know, there was a lot of work done on the software a while, even while the bridge card was a, was a thing. It was, it, it was a pro, you know, it was, it was a work in progress for quite a while, I think. Okay, we have a question over there. Yeah, so Bob, your name is all through the kernel source code for the CBM2 machines. Uh, can you talk about that project? Because the, the hardware was all over the map. Uh, there seemed to be no consistency. Nobody knew what they were. Nobody seemed to know, even in the company, if they were going to sell them. or They sold some and then recalled them. Some were prototypes. So could you just talk about that project? You're, you're talking about what I call the P&B series? Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was the code that I was working on when I tried to get the Commodore 64 to evolve basically out of it. So yeah, my yeah, my fingerprints are all over that stuff. And I had a I had a team of guys that were working for me by that time I was able to find a few good hires out here that were doing software stuff. So but I had done most of what was the kernel because I liked that concept of split, you know, having a separate operating environment, even though I couldn't do a real operating system. So um, the big thing was is those were the Porsche design cases to be business machines. They're all about the hard drives. They're going to be sexy, you know, look like futuristic terminals and stuff like that. And we had the 6510 chip to do memory management so we could go beyond the original memory. That so was I dabbled found. in that. So I, um, I did the uh, page swapper for uh, being yeah. able to run kernel code from another bank as well. And I also did the uh, CPM port that machine. There was an 8088 card uh, for that where uh, I did the BIOS mostly on the 6502, uh, so it was nice and lightweight on the uh, 8088 side. But uh, there was a hardware problem with that board, and I don't know if it ever went anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, the board was interfering with, it was too close to the, uh, to the 6502, 6510. 6510, yeah. 6509. Yeah. Oh, nine, yeah, right. 6509. Yeah, that's the one. With so yeah, there's two boards stacked too close to together, and they would uh, interfere. As I spent a week out at uh, Digital Research trying to do a multitasking, multi-threaded version of it called CPM83, and I finally hit a wall that uh, it wouldn't work. But I did get CPM ported to it. I don't know what they ever, what if they ever did to it. And I'm not sure if they ever published uh, the uh, bank swapping code I did also. That, you, know, you could write kernel code in a different bank, and it would swap automatically, automatically down to the, the lower bank and then run the kernel code and then return back up. A lot of pushes and pops and things like that. But, uh, was that, was that uh, BT Expert? There's a what? BT Expert? Was that the code you wrote? Yeah, I think that was it, yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Thank you. Um, I might be mex messing up names, but I think the person who at least who's memorialized on this might be on the panel, so it might be a good time to find out if anyone remembers the story. On the deathbed vigil there is, what, I think it looks like an Amiga floppy drive that is shoved into a wall that someone put a frame around and named it. And I, I, if, if you put a frame around something and name on it, there must be a good story behind why it ended up in the wall. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Haney and I worked on the A3000, and we spent a long time working on that product, and there was a day when uh, we were just going to get the production unit out, uh, but the boards came back, and we just had to validate that the boards were okay. 
uh, that we hadn't messed up anything. And I was super careful on that program. Oh, yeah. I double checked every net list. I, I tracked every change. I was just all over it. And so there couldn't possibly be anything wrong with it, but you still got to check. And so I build the unit up and I turn it on and things are kind of working, but the floppy doesn't work. I'm like, what the heck's going on? And so I spend a lot of time, you know, swapping out power supply, swapping out Agnes, swapping out Paula. I mean, how can this even happen? The, the motherboard doesn't do any value add to the floppy functionality at all. And just, I spend all day on the thing and I'm pulling my hair out and I'm comparing a working system with a non-working system and I'm drinking coffee and I'm reading books and it's like two o'clock in the morning and it's still not working and I gotta ship this, otherwise I'm dead. And then finally, the really small light bulb goes off. You know, the one that just by virtue of the fact that it has emitted a single photon it, it, is, it, it goes off and says, you know, try swapping the drive. And I swap the drive. And lo and behold, it's been this stupid, cheap drive holding me up for 12 hours, or, or five years of my lifespan, by the way. <laughs> and and I, I lost it, man. I, I took that thing, and I just winged it across the room. I, I was trying to propel it into the next universe, but the wall stopped it. And, and, and you know, I went home. And then, and then, you know, the next day, smart-ass Bryce Nesbitt comes in and he puts that frame around the thing. <laughs> and, and there it sat. And then, and then he goes and does this video with it on there, right? And then I go to a job interview, and every job interview I go to, they're like, uh, do you have anger management problems? <laughs> So bad. So, so that's the story. <laughs> All right. Do you have another question over there? All right. Um, can you tell us what happened to the DX64 versus the SX64? I, I saw at some point in time both existing, and yet the double drive never appeared. Yeah, I've been a piggyback on that. I, I heard the DX was just a, a rumor and never existed. What's the story? Yeah, I don't think we actually act, did the DX. Uh, maybe it was just something on a piece of paper written down, you know, sold. But we never, we did the SX and uh, it wasn't immensely popular because people just aren't that strong. <laughs> <laughs> And if you've ever looked, uh, I'll, you can you, you can tell the SX owners though because they have permanently imprinted in their hands these lines because our our case designer really liked lines at the time hard plastic lines and he, they went everywhere. And having opened up a, an SX, I can't imagine fitting another drive in there unless they came up with some little mini duplex drive or something because there's no room, no room. at all. There was a low profile drive that was smaller profile than that. It was made out of sheet metal and they tried it earlier at Commodore, but it basically couldn't hold any tolerances and they thought they were gonna get something like that back again. So too cheap even for Commodore then. <laughs> any more questions? Anybody? What can you tell us about the partnership with HP that seemed to actually come to fruition for some IC fabrication, and there seem to be some grand plans for software or graphic stuff um, that didn't really happen. Um, does anybody know anything about that? For who, H HP, what'd you call it? Yeah, so, when when Commodore was building the the Pandora chipset, the what everyone calls AGA outside of Commodore, um, we 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 had the the new Lisa chip was done in CMOS, and Commodore had its own CMOS process, but it was 1.5 micron and it was brand new and it wasn't it wasn't quite enough. Um, so we were we were making Lisas using HP as a as a contract fab, which really wasn't a thing people did all that much back in those days. It's not like today where like, you know, almost every chip company uses contract fabs. Um, 
and that was, you know, that was, but you know, it's, HP was this gigantic company. Um, there had been some discussions with HP kind of at the end, um, trying to interest them in using our graphics chips, uh, particularly various graphics chips that didn't actually exist yet. Um, <laughs> Uh, they were uh, they had some interest, but not enough interest to buy the company. Um, I think the I think the main thing they were trying to interest HP in was uh, was a, a chip design that hadn't really been built yet called Ombre. Um, that had a uh, that was a a, a new a, a totally re reinvented chipset. It wasn't it was actually just two chips. It wasn't. Amiga compatible. It was kind of in the spirit of Amiga a little bit, but it was uh, it was um, uh, it had its own uh, PA risk processor on it. Dr. Ed Hepler, who was one of our chip designers, had designed his own PA risk processor, and then added 3D instructions on top of the regular PA risk instructions. He chose PA risk mostly because it was an easily extensible risk instruction set. He didn't he didn't get any IP from HP on this. He just built it on his own. And um, I don't know how far along it was because the chip, it, this was this was in 93, 94 when Commodore wasn't really building much of anything because we had no money left. In fact, we had a big empty negative black hole in the bank account, I guess. But but uh, but that was that was as I understood it. They were they were very actively trying to find somebody to buy the company. Pretty much all of 94, and it, and there were some discussions. I wasn't even involved in the discussions with HP. Um, I think some of the people who stayed on after June in um, in '94, when all when everyone retreated back to the MOS building, had at least been in, on some of the meetings with other potential buyers. I was I was gone by then. I had left in June, so I I wasn't really a, I was in on some of the things that were being discussed within the company, but not and not on actually any of those meetings and. I'm not sure how real, how seriously HP was interested, because I didn't hear it directly from them. I just heard that we were talking about it, and that's, you know, that's something that they were discussing. Was we were we had something that might have made a very good workstation graphics card at that time, even though it wasn't done. It was, you know, it was one in progress. It might have been an incentive for them to invest. I mean, we'd had other companies interested in in. Licensing or, or OEMing. Uh, at one point, Sun Microsystems was interested in using Amiga 3000s with Unix as a low-end platform. Um, Epson was interested in OEMing some of our stuff, but somehow they always managed to uh, to make those deals not happen. <laughs> Another question over here. This is going to be in the weeds a bit, but. Um, since the fellow, I think his name is uh, Dave, was also talking about uh, FAB and the process that uh, Commodore had, it reminded me that the IEEE article on the 64 talked about the heat issues inside of the, the VIC-2, which everyone already has known about. And in fact, the person who was interviewed, or a person from Commodore, was saying, well, we have a new plastic that dissipates heat as well as a ceramic package, which I thought was, well, this is, Captain, we cannot change the laws of physics. But by the time the Amiga comes to Commodore and the, the masks were delivered, and you have to implement their design now on, com on Commodore's process for manufacturing, and I've seen this over a couple of 1,000s I've looked at, it alternates between which of two of the three, I haven't seen one of all, with all three of the original chips done in ceramic packaging as though the process was still being relearned or grown out because the complexity of the chips was greater than the VIC-2 had been relative to say even the original VIC. So was there that sort of thing going on? In other words, did Commodore have to grow up there manufacturing in order to accept the complexity of the Amiga's chips? Well, the one thing we were doing, we only had, as Dave said, one and a half micron process. When I started in 81, it was three, three microns. We went down to one and a half. But even after that, they were also doing um, optical shrinks. So you actually take the masks, you make them, and you shrink that mask, basically trying to make it a bit smaller and also making your gates 
smaller, but there was no, I mean, one and a half, I think, is as low as we got. Yeah. The, the only thing I can think of, Albert and I were just looking at each other, is th there was a beryllium lead frame they came out with for the R6 or R7 BIC chip to extract the heat out through the leads. And so the, in, in a circuit, most of your heat leaves through the PC board in the first place. It's not really the part you see the top normally. Um, so that may be what, what you're thinking of with the plastic. It's really about the conduction of the heat through the lead frames was, was my thought. Different design on a lead frame would help that heat, but the original Vic, because of the fact that we had to have the, the high voltage supplies in it, and we're trying to run it at the eight megahertz, which was pushing the limit. That's really where the right. a lot of the thermal was. And in at my time, when you saw a ceramic package, sometimes that meant we bonded it ourselves at MOS. Um, so that was like a typically in the R&D cycles and the quick turn cycles, and then you'd wait the six weeks for Kyocera, I think we were using to do the dip encapsulation for, for the plastic pack. So they would be more like production. So to, they had a longer lead time is my memory. Yeah, I mean, it, and uh, you know, as, as it was alluded to, is also the case that uh, when, you know, versus the VIC-2 chip, the uh, Amiga chips would be done in a, in a more modern, uh, uh, H, uh, HMOS 2 process, I guess, same as the C128 stuff. So it was, you know, it was, it was smaller geometry, so heat was, heat wasn't not an issue, but it was less of an issue per transistor side. Any more questions? Chris, I'm sorry. Uh, when you went from the Amiga 2000 to the 3000, what made you choose that f form factor? Because the Amiga 2000 was like a large computer, had a lot of space inside. The Amiga 3000 seemed more like a Unix workstation and really didn't have as much. What was the thought process behind that? I didn't like the 2000. <laughs> Nobody liked the 2000. <laughs> and, and, and so we tried flipping things around until we saw something that we liked and we ran with it. But, but why didn't you like it? But serious question. I, I, are you serious, serious answer is, are you kidding me? <laughs> it, 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 it's ugly, right? You, you know, it's huge. It's big. It, it's just, it, it's a PC case. And, and how sucky is that, that we got our own computer company and we're building PC lookalikes? You know, that, this is wrong on every level. And so I, the 3000, that, that thing... I'm proud of what we did there, uh, and, and a bunch of us worked hard on it, and we made the machine that we wanted it to be. And, and I didn't mean to pick on you. Uh, yeah. Well, and then they went back with the four thousand to you know, hey, we can buy these cases, and why would you do that? I it just uh, yeah, it, it made no sense. We we I mean we were we were engineering all of our flat cases to look like Commodore computers, why not do that with them all? I mean, it was, yeah, the, I mean, the 3000, I mean, the 2000, yeah, it was nice big and you could put a video toaster in it. Oh, of course, video toasters didn't exist when we built it. The, the only reason we really did, the, we, the only reason the 2000 went out that way is the, the case was designed in Germany and, um, you know, they, they were the guys also doing the PC stuff for the most part and we, we, when, when, when we brought, when the project came to the U.S., it was in 85, 86, and um, I guess it was 86, and, you know, Commodore, we had had, we not, had not had a really good year. We didn't have a lot of extra people working on stuff. It was me with help from George Robbins doing the whole A2000 motherboard, and Terry Fisher, of course, doing layout, and um, we weren't, cha we were doing a cost reduction. We weren't changing anything. None of us in Westchester liked the 2000. It was ugly. The, key, the stupid uh, mouse and keyboard connector ran right past where the DRAM had to go. So it was, let's, let's take the thing we're going to attach an antenna on and run it right past the noisiest possible part of the entire computer. I mean, there's just so many things about it that were ill-conceived. I understand what they were trying to do, but they didn't even try to make it look nice. Like, it couldn't have done something. <laughs> so... When, 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 it was, when the ball was back in the court where, where we could do what we wanted to do, we did what we wanted to do. And, you know, and there, there had been a call for something more compact that sat on your desk.
too. That was another thing. It's like not everybody was putting these things on the floor. And we also did ultimately have an A3000T that you could that looked like a PC and you could put on the floor. Right. Cool. Yeah. Two, two regrets. <laughs> two regrets about that case. One, I screwed up and did not make sure a toaster fit in it. So that, that's one. And the other one was the ZipRam. I don't know if you remember that, but yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard some groaning out there. Oh, oh boy. Hit a nerve? Uh, hit a nerve. Okay. Uh, yeah, and a good part of the problem is we were trying to do stuff in that system that w we weren't quite re wasn't quite ready. What we really needed was to wait several years until you could get EDO DRAM on a DIM or a SIM, but we, we had to choose between the stupid zips that were uh, using our static column, static column mode RAM, buying off-the-shelf SIMs or coming up with our own SIMs, and that's the way we went. The, the zip. The, we messed up. We, we messed up. It was, it, was, <laughs> it was the wrong decision. It, it, there were other things we could have done that were better, and they were solved on the A4000, I guess. The, well, because they had to screw up all the other stuff on the A4000, so. The good news is it was the kind of place where you can make decisions sometimes, well, not always, but you know, making decisions and screwing up kind of go hand in hand sometimes. So. Uh, VIC-20 memory map. Any funny stories why the video RAM moves when you expand 8K or more? What was that? VIC-20 memory map where you Can expand. you say it louder? If you, if you expand the VIC-20 more than 8K, the, the video RAM moves in the memory map. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, we didn't have that big an expansion card at that point in time. <laughs> in fact, that was, I was, had to fight to even get a memory expansion for that computer because that was thought to be totally unnecessary by the management. And, um, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, there were there was there were some flaws in there because I had only a part-time hardware engineer to work with me on the actual computer design. He was a good guy, but he was busy with the toy computer. So, yeah, there was there was some flaws in that when it came to hardware. But hey, it shipped. <laughs> Any more questions? Got one over here. Um, how come the CD32 was only sold in Europe, and did Commodore recognize the lack of success of early CD-based systems like the Philips CDI or Sega CD? I don't think we really have an answer for that. Uh, we, we did recognize the failure of the early CD systems like the Philips, but uh, by then there was too much momentum behind it, so it kept going. Um, I have no idea why it wasn't a success in the U.S. Probably, mark probably the lack of marketing. Lack of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, that's the problem with the Commodore, the marketing, yeah. yeah. Well, another problem was there's still a real crunch. Uh, CD32 was being done in 93, where Commodore had no money. So they couldn't make as many CD32s as they conceptually could have sold by about a factor of, you know, they probably could have sold three times as many, even based on what it did. The idea was, I think, not so much to be like a Philips, it was supposed to be a game machine, right? You know, which was a little bit more along the lines of, uh, you know, Sega and others who had done game machines that were, I think, a little more successful than the, you know, than the living room computer, the thing that we tried to do with uh, CDTV and CDTVCR. Um, that, at least that was, I, I didn't work on it. I, you know, I was hanging out with the guys who did, and that seemed to be their, their uh, you know, focus. Yeah, the lack of money was a definite issue back then. There were a whole bunch of chips uh, that were held captive in the Philippines yep. uh, that we could, Commodore could never get out because they wanted money. Um, when I started working for uh, this 
Chinese company, which was one of the people who ended up with uh, Amiga Technology. We actually bought those chips out of the Philippines because the Chinese had the money. So hey, that was actually pretty good that these chips were stored for us <laughs> later for the next generation. So I actually have a question for the group. So I was, by 1990, I was already not only out of Commodore, but out of Atari, so I, and I had a little perspective. I was at Genie, and um, I flew out to Paris for an Amiga Developers Conference, and uh, uh, I mean, my goal at Genie was to try to get uh, a Commodore to do support on Genie instead of Bix, but I had a chance to meet whoever was the CEO at the time. I think it was Mehdi, maybe? Mehdi Ali. Uh, Mehdi Ali. And I said, look, I'm puzzled about one thing. You guys make these great computers that are terrific. There's a t-shirt. This was like a setup from Paris. In that show. I swear we did not rehearse this ahead of time. Um, so I said, look, you guys, your computer is world class at graphics. It's world class at music. But yet your advertising is like competing against an IBM PC as a business machine. Why are you trying to do all things to all people instead of focusing on what you're good at? And his answer was, well, by God, we were once the number one computer company in the world, and we're going to be number one again, and we've got to do everything. So guys, you, you made great products over, the, over the, that period of time, and yet the company failed. Do you think it was a product of marketing, or does Andy have another? <laughs> Before I go on, what else do you have in that bag? <laughs> but but, I, but I, I know you guys aren't marketing guys, but if you could tell the, the management back in 1990-ish to do something different, what would you have done differently? Yeah, yeah, the med the Medi issue was, I think, our main problem. Uh, the people he brought in were just the wrong people for the company, and uh, yeah, they took it down. So it's Im it's Im yeah. Commodore marketing was never that great, right. but Medi's team was even worse. Right. Well, I, I I do marketing think. Was pretty good. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I guess yeah. from the software point of view, uh, yeah. do you remember the software ads for uh, the sixty four software? where they show a pile of car cartridges and say, look, we have software. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of Commodore was a function of what Jack Tremiel and his legacy that he left. He created an environment where we had, there was the, the Santa Clara group, there was Japan, there was Texas, and there was uh, Valley Forge. And they were, we were competing against each other. Mm. Part of it was that this Jack felt that if we, if we had all these divisions competing with each other for resources, that someone rise to the top with the best idea. Well, it was a reasonable solution, but still it created a lot of tension in the company. And on top of that, Jack was the one guy, all marketing flowed through him. He gave engineers a chance, as you can see from the commentary here, we all had a lot of freedom to do things. Marketing did not. <laughs> it all ran through Jack. So there was that, he was the pivotal guy that said, okay, that's why he had a, I always used to comment about him saying, make it for the masses, not the classes. Well, you can see that in the product line that was developed early on. And when he left, there was no structural management, business plans. Did anybody ever hear of a business plan at Commodore? Yeah. No. When, when, you know, when, when, I, when I started companies, we did business plans because there was a reason for that. But that didn't exist because Jack had it all up here. So when he left, there was a, a total void that existed, and they tried to fill that, backfill that in. Right. And they brought in lots of different people, when, looking from afar, from my perspective, that never really understood how to take that next step. And I think that, that that really was a problem, that Jack created a nice environment that was successful initially, but then it wasn't able to grow and, 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 and it just, just kind of continued to fall. That's my perspective from the outside. Look inside and why I left, and, and then after looking back. Yeah, if I could just eulogize about the Amiga, we, I, was, I was given the opportunity to go to New York for the launch. And uh, we were at Lincoln Center. Andy Warhol came in with Deborah Harry. We did the painting. We did a ton of commercials for the Super Bowl while I was there. That had so much momentum no. and no marketing behind it. So that was actually a great machine. There, I, if you look at it today, what it can do, it's, it's amazing. What, what do you, 
Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> wait a second. We, Bill, we we didn't like prepare this. How is this happening? He, every time there's a there's a comment, he has like, a T-shirt to answer. <laughs> His wardrobe is, is gone now at home. This is, this is it. Where are you moving to from here? <laughs> Wait, we got to see what the next T-shirt is. we got to see the future. But to answer your question, it was a lack of marketing, really, and lack of follow-through on momentum. And the 64 and the Vic were the right product at the right time, and they kind of sold themselves. You could go to Costco and all the discount houses, and everybody wanted it. It was a, it was a rising thing. And with the Amiga, it became more of a sell. You had to prove to people, why is this useful? Yeah, after Jack left, there was a transition from selling in Kmart, and they tried to market the Amiga in, in, in dealerships. Uh, and so there was a big layoff in engineering at that time, and I said, put my name on the list while you still have money, because the marketing team just didn't have it together for, for what they want to do with the Amiga. That's my, my, my opinion, and you can fight me on that if you want. But I, yeah, well, they bought a company without having a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's really, I mean, that's what I say, that that, that, that plan didn't exist again because Jack wasn't there, and but yet I thought it was a good acquisition looking from the outside in at the time, but then there was no follow-through, and that marketing really did mess that up. In my opinion, it should have really been the next phone computer. That's, yep. that's what it was designed for. Mm -hmm. It was designed to be the next phone computer, yeah. not a business machine. Yes, and because that, yeah. that's what they established as a niche that they owned, and... Um, that's that's it was, it yeah. being, I mean the thing the thing was it, it yeah. did become in reality the next home computer when uh, a 500 came out two years after the uh, well not even quite two years after the uh, after the a 1000 mm -hmm. and that was I mean the a 1000 got you know other than that initial push there wasn't much marketing of any kind and yeah but I've heard I've heard from a lot of people from Europe uh, also that yeah they were they were selling always selling always trying to sell the business aspects which just weren't there right. you know, um i think that the, wasn't the niche that commodore yeah owned. it was never the niche the commodore owned, and it wasn't the niche the, that the amiga did either very well i think there was another thing that marketing never quite coped with at commodore even even i mean they did it pretty well in europe but that was mostly about games and part of it was that when you know the heyday of the pet vic 20 c64 when it started out um, you bought a computer because you wanted to do computers. You didn't know what you were going to do with the computer. Pretty soon you found out you wanted to play games, but you bought it because it was a, you know, it was, it was a, it's a $500 computer. It wasn't that expensive. Everyone, everyone told you. I mean, you know, Jack won, you know, Commodore won a Clio for the, 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 the kid who went off to college and, and got sent back because he, because he was an idiot because he hadn't had a home computer, yeah, guilt, you know. Guilt advertising. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, so, I mean, people just wanted a computer. After a while, it wasn't, I want a computer, it's I want to do this thing with a computer. And that was a fundamental change that, you know, that, I mean, a lot of companies didn't react to, but Commodore certainly didn't, because there was a lot of stuff you could do with Amigas, and there was never an advertisement, well, there was rarely an advertisement that told you, other than the gaming, which actually, you know, that's why they sold two million or close to two million A500s in Europe in a year, is because, you know, the game was the thing, and you know, you could go to the UK and get the Batman pack. <laughs> but again, that's yeah. it stayed in that category of, of yeah. home right. game. And, and there was thing, nothing right? wrong with selling that. It you know, and and you know, but we also had that video niche. That you know, wh where was the advertising for that? Well, maybe you got an ad at the in the back of Toaster magazine or something at some point. But you know, Commodore didn't pursue that. They didn't push it. And, you know, and we did have a CEO who didn't use computers and didn't watch television at that point. So, you know, maybe the fact that, you know, and, and also knew everything. I think that was part of the problem, too, with management is when, you know, when management doesn't know things and is, you know, a brilliant manager, they go and learn those things. And when, when they already know everything and no one can tell them everything, you know, a lot of things go wrong. Also, the fact that, you know, Commodore has plagued for years by the fact that we had super high executive salaries, they were make you know some of these guys were making more than the CEO of IBM or the CEO of Apple. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. 
So uh, I wanted to. Well, you've seen my film. You know how I feel. <laughs> so I wanted to throw something out from the uh, from Usenet. If you guys remember that, uh, famously the quote was Commodore Marketing. If they were selling sushi, they would call it cold raw dead fish. <laughs> The, uh, the original impetus for the uh, purchase of Amiga actually came from, a, Betty might remember this, a general management meeting in Europe. Uh, they, they met where, you know, what should they do next? This was after Jack left. And they said, they sent back word, we have to compete with the Sinclair QL. <laughs> and, and that's actually one why we went out looking for a third party, almost done machine to, uh, to release as the next generation because we needed to compete with that QL. The quantum leap. <laughs> uh, sorry. So I remember in the 90s, I was at the World of Commodore. They had, they had that whole big thing at the Palladium. That was when Harry Copperman had taken over Commodore and he was releasing a lot of new things. But he did have a marketing campaign. And I remember he hired a company called Mesnevetier Burger Carry Schmitterer and I worked with a guy named Jeff Berg on there, and we were going through the, all the different uh, demos and stuff to show on there. Does anybody remember the Stevie commercials? Yep. Mm -hmm. Those, that, was the, that was the advertising campaign, and, and I actually have a videotape of that, but that was about the extent of any real advertising. And then as soon as Harry Copperman came, it was as soon as he left. Like, he came on, Things were happening, then he was gone, and it seemed like everything stopped. Does anybody remember those times? Yep. So what was videotape? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't really have anything to say. I don't have anything to add, yeah, yeah. Um, they, I mean, really, um, Irving Gould was playing musical CEOs for a while there, and um, there, it was it was probably a three year problem. If, 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 a, if a competent manager had been brought in as CEO, for, and, and allowed to change Commodore for a solid three years without being interfered with, something could have been done with the right person. Actually, it was funny because uh, uh, Jean-Louis Gasset of Apple had tried to make that deal with Commodore to come and run the company, but he wanted, you know, he, he wanted three years, and that, was, with an engineering background, maybe that was a guy who could have, made, who could have uh, ended up with a different result. Of course, he went on to make B, and that didn't really go anywhere either, but, but at least they gave it a try. No more questions to the audience. All right, I, um, let's see, we'll try to wrap this up. A few questions from YouTube. Um, someone was commenting on the Commodore 64 Basic and how it compares to, like for example, Simon's Basic. So Simon's Basic was an extended basic um, it didn't, you know, the, ba the basic that came with the Commodore 64 didn't provide easy commands for graphics and sounds. So, do you have any comments on, you know, the appearance of extended basics to fill, you know, fill that need for the extended graphics and sounds? I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that one too. I, not even um, graphics and sound. Where's the else statement? <laughs> if then else. Yeah, okay, so six weeks you can do a certain amount of work, <laughs> and then you have maybe a couple months to actually get the bugs out of it, and then you get release a chip and realize that you have left out one of the lowercase characters, so you have, end up having a penny deducted from your paycheck for as long as you're at Commodore. Um, no, we knew other people were going to do more with it. That's the whole reason that the cartridge, that Simon Basic was a fantastic example of people taking advantage, you know, if we'd had a faster disk, I think we'd seen a lot more things that loaded into all that RAM that was sitting there hidden underneath the, the basic and the operating system. That was all meant to be swapped out and something better to be put in. And that was really the whole genesis for, you know, why we had the heavy duty programmers reference guide, why, you know, there wasn't, you know, not only did we tell you how to program in basic, but we tried to tell you every trick that we, we knew at that time. All right, I have a question for Dave Haney. There were some AAA prototypes shown in the deathbed video. Any background, background information, what happened to them? Were they scrapped? They were not scrapped. Um, th that, was a, that, that was a motherboard I made called Nix that was just to prove those chips. 
Um, chips didn't work very well, but they did. We did get graphics up on the screen. They all needed revision. Well, maybe they already needed revisions. The problem was the Andrea, the Andrea chip had a bug where the uh, output buffers on the data bus wouldn't tri-state. So the only thing you could see on the bus was the Andrea chip. You couldn't tr test any of the other three chips. Um, that that was that board was not a production of any sort board. It was just an experiment to to give these yeah. chips a home when once they finally arrived. It had connectors for my logic analyzer all over the place. It had um, it had some things I was experimenting with, like it had uh, it had um, ROM on a, a on a SIM module. It had um, actually had chip RAM on on modules as well. It had a network in it. It was it was just it was just for testing out a bunch of new ideas all at once, including AAA. There were three of those made. One of them was killed based on a, a combination of tragic uh, errors. One was that uh, I put a I put a, um, a a 12 volt uh, pin on the ROM module to allow us to use flash sometime in the future because that was just that was a very new thing we couldn't afford to put it on there but you could you know when you if instead of putting a ROM on there you could eventually put flash memory on there um, the problem was that uh, the it's that that pin was right ne right next to a data line D D5 in fact and the other problem was when uh, when my buddy Fisher made this SIM module. We Commodore made, never made SIM modules. The, the measurement was a little bit wrong, so the thing wobbled. And one day I was out of the lab, and some chip guys came in to do some experiments, and they plugged the module in the wrong way, and D5 on that board got shocked. So that board was no, that board was toast. There were two other boards. I, I ended up taking that one home and selling it at a charity auction. I was raising money for breast cancer, and uh, the others uh, were went to two of the chip designers. Those were the ones that that sort of kind of maybe worked. Um, there wasn't much we could do to fix the chip bugs. Uh, th those chips actually had had even more bugs that were were fixed a little bit. There's a thing you can do called fibbing, focused ion beam. You can basically you can basically laser your chip to uh, change a few things. So we had. We had one chip that was fibbed to uh, fix it so that it would work with regular DRAM and one chip that was fixed to use with VRAM. Uh, there were a few other things. There was, a, there was a program that allowed you to skiggle a graphic image to display because the LUT was all messed up. The order of the, of the colors were all messed up. So it, nothing you actually put directly into the graphics buffer would look normal or anything you, even recognizable. But if you skiggled it around a bit, it would it would work. That was uh, some of the software. Some of the chip guys were writing all these routines in AREX to control it. So it was it, it did stuff, but it wasn't it wasn't really a you know it wasn't wasn't even close to working system. And those three boards were there. And at you know in '93 they weren't going to be making any new chips. That was we got what we got, and we tried to get as far as we could with it. And you know sort of had our fingers crossed that at some point a you know, somebody would come along and like Superman and rescue us, and maybe we'd be able to make some more uh, some Rev twos, but that never happened. All right, uh, we 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 could probably keep going on for quite a while, yeah. but I think it's time to start to wrap it up. I just wanted to make one comment. Um, you know, it's anniversary of the Commodore sixty four, and you know, Jack Trammell was saying, you know, computers for the masses, not the classes. And you know, when I was a kid, my first computer was a. Um, I, I, that I used was in middle school, you know, Apple IIe doing logo, and it was like, well, I want one of those things, but it was like $1,200. I couldn't afford that. So my brother's friend is like, I have a Commodore 64, the whole set, you know, for $150. I'm like, oh, wow. My dad's like, yeah, I'll help you. So <laughs> I was a actually able to get a computer, and that started my interest in computers was to actually to be able to f afford the computer. Um, and so that's my story for the Commodore 64. And pass it up back to Chris. I speak for everyone when I say we are very appreciative of the last two and a half hours that you have just given us. Right, give him a big hand. If, if maybe one more round, if just a couple seconds each person or whatever, I was thinking, would you like to share a non-technical anecdote 
that is maybe not common knowledge of your time at Commodore? And anybody go or go in order, whatever. I'm trying to go first, but we'll just go around. <laughs> Non-technical? Oh, gosh, there's an, I, I no, probably... Personal. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of a, of a, uh, a, a Jack Tramiel story. I was going to say being yelled at Jack. Yeah, yeah probably, I mean, like maybe the taxi cab story. I always liked that one just because it showed his personality. Right. And uh, uh, if people don't know about Jack Tramiel, he, he, he came over from uh, uh, Europe, from Germany after World War II, and he, was, he started as a taxi cab driver in New York City before he became a typewriter repairman. And so we were traveling with this is now night now move forward up to the 1970s and eight late early late 70s we're traveling a taxi cab with him and the taxi cab driver was running along jack sitting in the front seat and he starts to get agitated about this taxi cab driver the route he was taking so we gets we get to the destination and jack refuses to give this taxi cab driver a tip As a matter of fact he says i don't even owe you the money that, that you're trying to charge me here and and so what's going on and so we get out of the cab, so he pays the guy, and he get out, and I go, Jack, well, what was that about? He said, well, I was a taxi cab driver, and he took us on the longest route so he could pad the fare. <laughs> so, and then the other guy said, well, Jack, why did you bother? And he said, practice. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> that tells you a little bit about the man. <laughs> All right, so this is a story I heard but didn't see personally. So Jack is in Germany with some German executives, and they're driving down the Autobahn. And Jack turns to the other guys and say, how do you like this road? And they say, oh, we love this road. It's the Autobahn, the greatest road in the world. And Jack said, this is my road. And they said, what do you mean? It's the Autobahn. It belongs to the German people. And he said, during World War II, I built this road. He was a slave in the, after he was in the concentration camp, and he helped actually construct that road. And that was the message he wanted to share. Um, I have like a little personal fun one where I had the Z8000 team and we flew over for a show in Germany and we took the corporate jet that Jack was supposed to take, but you know, it's kind of a small jet. So he took, he took regular, but everybody thought that who was going to show up was Jack Tramiel. So at the airport, there's the mayor, the marching band, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> Luckily, we got diverted, so we landed at another airport, and they were like trying to figure out how they could make it to Hanover Airport to greet Jack. It was just a bunch of engineers. <laughs> so, and meanwhile, while they were unloading the plane that particular time, they forgot to the, the, set the gas, so it flowed between the two wings. So we're carrying stuff out of the out of the private plane and it's tipping more and more to one side. <laughs> and we're like, I think something's wrong here because the wing's about ready to hit the pavement. And they were like, oh yeah, we screwed up. <laughs> so it almost got real exciting. <laughs> so I guess I'll continue the thing and tell a Jack Trammell story. Um, Neil actually told part of the story. Uh, I was uh, at one of the Hanover affairs. I happened to rent a, uh, a 280 SE as my rental car. And that was the largest car of anybody who was renting. So I ended up uh, chauffeuring Jack uh, Tremell and Sig Hartman around for the entire show between Hanover and Braunschweig, which is where Commodore had its uh, engineering office at the time. And so, yeah, we drove on the Autobahn and Jack actually pointed out to Sig that this was a road he built. Um, and like his, they were also, drinking pretty heavily on the way back from the show. Uh, and at one point, they just started singing German songs from the war. <laughs> so yeah, I, Jack loved to sing. I, I told that story to Leonard Tramiel, and he said, oh, my dad loved to sing. <laughs> it was definitely a surreal experience. I mean, a side of Jack I'd never seen before. No, I really can't top anything like that. <laughs> My time at Amiga, DRAM has been a problem since uh, before Christ, I think. And <laughs> we, we, once we got money at Amiga, we would go shopping in Silicon Valley. And we'd go up and down, was it the 4-0 something? 
in, uh, I don't know, in, in Silicon Valley. And, and we would go buy DRAMs, there'd be tractor trailers full of parts. And when we needed parts, whether it be resistors, bypass capacitors, or RAMs, we'd, we'd have a wad of money, and I would go with the techs, because I could you know, figure out, will this work, will that work in the circuit? And we'd, we'd build products that way. So it's nothing new. It's been a chip shortage forever. Uh, well, I wasn't at Commodore long enough to have a Jack story because I started in October of 83 and Jack left uh, right after, not long after CES in uh, 84, so, um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a good ride, <laughs> with, even without Jack. You got one. I'll tell a story. So. Uh, the A500 is called the B52. Anybody know why? Because George Robbins, who did the A500, lived at work, had a big ass stereo system in the CAD room with giant speakers and turntables, and you would go in there at 10 o'clock at night and start playing B52's music, which is just like you know, just all time. And you wouldn't leave until 6 a.m. in the morning with the jitters because you've just been in there all night long. But uh, anyway, a little tribute to... CD changer all full of b all, all full of B-52s. Yeah, there was, a, there was kind of a corporate raid on Crazy Eddie when they went out of business. You guys might know that from, from being up here in Jersey. And so the speakers, the, the stereo, the... Uh, the, the multi, the, back when you had a cartridge for your CD changer, all came from Crazy Eddie, and they were all over Commodore, but George had it all built up in one cubicle, and yeah, you, 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 if you were working late at night in the, in the CAD room, you'd hear B-52s, at least five albums worth. <laughs> Some, sometimes he'd reload. So, uh, let's see, uh, early in 94, I uh, was called in on a Monday morning. About three or four of us were called into a meeting and I'm like, what? And it was just a weird group of people. And uh, we were told, uh, yeah, you guys were out on Friday, and uh, you know things aren't doing so great. Feel free to use the fax machine, the telephones, print your resumes, whatever. And uh, you know, if you need to look for a job, and all three of four or five of us, whatever, I don't feel so bad about where I was Friday. And interestingly enough, I was on an interview with Dave DiOrio, who I had followed to VLSI Technology. After there, I got uh, laid off. The day I got laid off, the woman in the other room had said, uh, Dave Diorio is on line one. Uh, literally, I just shook hands, got my severance check, and Dave offered me another job. So I had followed him to the next two companies. Actually, you, uh, you probably know that the, uh, the uh, uh, Rock Lobster uh, uh, printed on the board of the, uh, of the Amiga 500. You probably did that. I didn't do that one. You didn't do that one? Okay. I, I did a different story. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell one on Andy because he was, uh, uh, he, he was, he drove Jack, you know. But, but Andy, I would go back and forth uh, between the 1200 Wilson Drive uh, location and MOS technology because I was taking care of the PDPs and the VAXs and uh, Andy would blow by me every day as he was on 202 going to the, the 1200 Wilson Drive and it was it was I, I, I can't believe he never got tickets he just, it was, uh, it, it was uh, uh, sonic booms when he would go by me. Uh, and it was every day. I, I, I don't know, how long did it take you to actually make that, that, that trip? Five, six minutes. Yeah. That's... <laughs> and no evidence. <laughs> he had this little rocket ship. It was just unbelievable. A little Toyota rocket ship. Anyway. I wasn't at the company a whole lot. Uh, I spent some time there in the beginning, but then I did most work off-site. But one thing I do remember is uh, when I came in, there was often different decorations. Uh, you walk in, you go and go to the lab, and there would be a big hole on the side of the wall. <laughs> somebody had poked a hole in the wall to get to the other side to, to get in because the 
cutting other ways. And, and I've used the trick of going over walls myself at, at certain companies where you know, people go home at night that have normal jobs and, and engineers typically work until the job's done and you have to go over walls. And I actually at another company went over a wall once and after I flipped the light on, the guy, I, never, I didn't even know, what do they call those things, the, the pins that stick up, they stick papers on? I almost got skewered by one of those. <laughs> I landed and I landed on the paperwork and I tore the paper a little bit and it was like, what do they call that? Spindle? Yeah. Uh, like, like, yeah. There's a name for that. I don't know. Something people, that'll injure you. Yeah, yeah. but the, the people that used to be away, they kept the paperwork from getting lost. They'd stick it on the, on the needle and, and it would stick there. But that sucker was about that long. Anyway, uh, but it was always entertaining to come down the Commodore. And the other thing that I found very entertaining was Hardware that wouldn't work, ICs that wouldn't be working. I'd go into the lab and you'd see these wires and, and I had the ice cube tray, <laughs> but Bill had all these wires and, and it, sometimes it was an external voltage a power supply and he put power on, on an IC, that, not on the IC, but actually on the pads, uh, the, the substrate. And so he was playing all kinds of games and, and I'm a hardware engineer also and I know a lot of these tricks, but. Bill often amazed me. So, you know, a lot of my stuff was, I was young then. <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting and fun place to work. And uh, the group of guys down there was top notch and everybody worked and did everything they could to get the job done. And time was never, time was always the factor, but as far as the people working there, it wasn't, oh, it's five o'clock, it's time to go home. That, that was never really the attitude there. Everybody worked, get the job done. All right, Bill, last words. Um, I don't have any stories to add. I told most of my stories. I'll plug my book, uh, Back Into the Storm. Uh, so all my book stories are in there. Uh, but the book was dedicated uh, to Dave DiOrio. Uh, that it was him that he affected my life a lot. He taught me how to see past the chip boundary into what the chip's doing. And uh, I, I was, yeah, to Dave DiOrio. So, all right. Thank you guys, thank you Bill for inviting them, we really appreciate it.